Uh, welcome everyone and good evening. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the South Bend Community School Corporation Board of Trustees. Uh, this May 1st, uh, we had a closed session at 4 p.m. and we, I am now calling the meeting to order. And I will ask Mr. Hernandez to do the roll call, please. Good afternoon, Ms. Stephanie Ball. Present. Dr. Stir Green. Here. Ms. Kate Lee. Here. Ms. Jeanette McCullough. Present. Mr. Mark Costello. Here. Ms. Leslie Wesley. Present. Mr. John Anella. Here. Thank you. Uh, it is now recommended that the Board of School Trustees adopt our agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to adopt? So moved. Moved by Ms. Wesley, seconded by Dr. Green. Any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, roll please. Ms. Ball? Aye. Dr. Green? Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. McCullough? Aye. Mr. Costello? Aye. Ms. Wesley? Aye. Mr. Arnella? Aye. Okay, we've adopted our agenda. Now we are moving on to recognitions and superintendent announcements. So we will turn it over to you, Dr. Cummings. Thank you, President Ella. We want to begin our recognitions and superintendent announcements with a moment of silence. Last week, school social workers, teachers, friends, and relatives tried to explain to students at Jefferson and Jackson why 11-year-old Tyon Horston, who was shot and killed not too many blocks from here, wouldn't be coming home. Saturday, myself, social workers, teachers, and friends went to a funeral for an 11-year-old boy. He was in sixth grade. While we're going to do a moment of silence, we have got to put our weaponry down. We have got in South Bend to find another way to deal with our conflicts than shooting and killing our children. It's unacceptable. And I'm going to talk about it as often as I need to. He was an 11 year old boy. Regardless of the circumstances, he was 11. Join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And now I'd like to ask Board Secretary Dr. Seward Green if he would read the Asian American Pacific Islander Month Proclamation. Dr. Green. Thank you, it's a privilege. Uh, the vast diversity of languages, religions, and cultural traditions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders continues to strengthen the fabric of American society. From the arrival of the first Asian American and Pacific Islander immigrants 161 years ago, to those who arrive today, as well as those native to Hawaiian Islands and to our Pacific Island territories, all possess the common purpose of fulfilling the American dream and leading a life bound by the American ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. During Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we remember <laughs> the challenges and celebrate the achievements that define their history. <clears throat> The theme this year is Unite Our Nation by Empowering Equality. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have endured and overcome hardship and heartache. In the earliest years, tens of thousands of gold rush pioneers, coal miners, transcontinental railroad builders, as well as farm and orchard laborers were subject to unjust working conditions, prejudice and discrimination, yet they excelled. Even in the darkness of the Exclusion Act and Japanese internment, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have persevered providing for their families and creating opportunities for their children. Amid these struggles, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have contributed in great and significant ways to all aspects of society. They have created works of literature and art thrived as American athletes and prospered in the world of academia. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have played a vital role in our nation's economic and technological growth by establishing successful enterprises and pushing the limits of science. They are serving in positions of leadership within the government more now than ever before. 
And along with all of our great servicemen and women, they have defended the United States from threats at home and abroad, serving our nation with valor. From the beaches of the Pacific Islands and the California coast, the grasslands of Central Asia and the bluegrass of Kentucky, and the summits of the Himalayas and the Rocky Mountains, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community hails from near and far. This is the story of our more perfect union, that it is diversity itself that enriches and is fundamental to the American story. Now, therefore, we, the South Bend Community School Corporation Board of School Trustees, by virtue of the authority vested in us as school board members, do hereby proclaim May 2023 as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We call upon the people of the United States to learn more about the history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and to observe this month with appropriate programs and activities. Attested to this day, Monday, May 1st, 2023, Dr. C. Cummings, Superintendent, John Anella, School Board President. Thank you, Dr. Green. We don't have a board meeting next week, but we certainly wanted to say a week in advance, Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. We are so grateful for our teachers. We're so grateful for what they do every single day. The hard work of the district in ensuring that students are reading and they're graduating is being done by our teachers every single day. We wake up and we're grateful for you. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. Oh, good idea. I see a lot of teachers here in red. Could you all stand up? Would you mind, please? If you're a teacher, stand up. Thank you so much. Uh, May 10 is actually uh, National School Nurses Day. Thank you to our nurses for taking care of all of our students. April 24 through 28 was um, After School Professionals Appreciation Week. Thank you for everything you're doing after school. It's National Library Week, April 23rd through 29. Thank you to our librarians for making sure that our students have the books to read. And May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so next, I'd like to start with Mr. Jeff Hemmerlein and the LaSalle Academy Band, Mr. Hemmerlein. Good evening, President Ella, members of the board, Dr. Cummings. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening to be recognized for a music award that we recently uh, received at LaSalle Academy. And I'm going to ask uh, our band director, Ms. Dawn Forsyth, to come up to give a little more detail, much better than I could um, present to all of you about what exactly this award entails. Thank you, Dr. Cummings and the board, everyone involved here. Thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, this was my first year at LaSalle Academy, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, I can tell you that um, our journey started at the beginning of the school year, and um, I had several students coming in before school, some coming in after school, getting extra help, whatever was necessary to do what we needed to do. Uh, in March, March is Music in Our Schools Month, and in March, they have several different opportunities for uh, bands, choirs, orchestra to perform at the state level. Uh, the first one we do is called Solo and Ensemble Competition, and that was held um, at North Northwood High School. And students can play either a solo or any type of ensemble in, in front of a judge. The students get a, a judge's rubric and they get a medal for their earning. And I had 75 students get gold medals. So um, that was our Check number one. <laughs> Check number two, which was brand new for uh, LaSalle, was I took the jazz ensemble to uh, the jazz contest at Goshen Middle School. I guess they call it Goshen Junior High. And uh, we performed. We ended up getting gold. And I had two students actually get soloist awards. Uh, Courtney Marshall received a outstanding soloist award for her um, solo in one of the songs. And then Yuna Ahn got two solo awards. And so we were earned gold by all the judges that night. So uh, that was uh, number two on our list of, um, on our journey. Uh, the last one, um, March 17th, uh, the seventh grade band went to Penn High School and performed, and so did the eighth grade. Each band performed for three judges and um, 
all both bands got gold from all the judges and the eighth graders received um an outstanding recognition that they that um they call with distinction so that meant they were among the best of the best so i'm honored to be able to share that with you and thank the students and parents involved thank you Thank you, Ms. Forsyth. Thank you, Mr. Hammerlein. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Jim Seitz from Adams High School to introduce our Indiana Outstanding High School Student of Spanish Award, Mr. Seitz. Thank you, Dr. Cummings, uh, President Nell, and the entire school board. We are extremely excited. We have uh, a few recognitions tonight from Adams High School. And so I would first like to uh, invite up our amazing uh, Spanish teacher and World Language Department Chair, Mrs. Stanton Verdusco. So as a Spanish teacher, uh, we are eligible in the state of Indiana to nominate students. Uh, we have up to four nominations we can uh, do uh, for the Indiana State Award for Spanish. And I have four wonderful students, two seniors, two juniors, uh, who I thought were um, exemplified what it means to be a good Spanish student from not only being amazing in class, but some of the things they do outside of class, like Spanish club or Spanish honor society. One of them takes two Spanish classes. So all of these things um, made me decide that these four students deserved it. So I would like for each of them just to introduce themselves so you know who they are and put a face with the name, but um, they deserve this award. They're awesome. I'm Lucy O'Brien. I'm a junior at Don Adams. Um, I'm Marcelina Kukowska. I'm a senior at Adams. I'm Lauren Gallegos. I'm a junior at Adams. Hola, me llamo Erika. My name is Erika, and I'm a senior at Adams. Congratulations, everyone. Slides, if you'll bring them all up, we'll take some, we'll take some pictures. We would really like her to be in the photo of this, actually. Good. Thank you all. Congratulations. Back to you, Mr. Seitz. Well, I believe, are we on the band? I don't have my paper in front of me. The band, yes. Okay. So it was uh, right around the time uh, the NCAA tournament brackets had, had been revealed. And we got uh, an interesting email. And when Mr. Graham first brought it to my attention, I thought it was a, a scam or something. And so it was the athletic director of uh, Creighton and the men's basketball team and women's basketball team for Creighton were playing at the same time in two different locations. And the women's team was sent to South Bend. And so they wanted for us to come and be the Creighton band for the Creighton basketball game at the uh, ACC. And so we were able to uh, take about 28, I believe, of our uh, band members. And so I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Kevin Graham and some of his band leaders up here to talk a little bit about that experience. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so the Creighton game was a little crazy because if you didn't know anything about the NCAA tournament, you they get their date on Sunday and then they have to figure out how they're gonna get there on Monday. So Monday evening, I got the email, and then we had to put a pet band together for a Thursday or Friday game. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, the students got to be a part of an NCAA tournament, and they were ready for it because of how great the basketball teams here are at South Bend. And so we had the tunes ready, and we just had to learn their fight song. They were so kind. Uh, they sent us T-shirts, and they were, made a really kind donation to the program as a whole and would have kept donating if they would have kept winning. So. <laughs> Yeah, so we were rooting extra hard for them to win. 
Um, I just want to introduce uh, some of the students that were a part of it. And then I want to mention that we were we were limited in the students, but uh, we were uh, Notre Dame was kind enough to give us a group rate for tickets to get all the students there so that they could watch the game. And I'm not I still haven't figured out who did it, but someone at Notre Dame that they contacted sent them to Adams. And so I want to just thank uh, the team at Notre Dame for sending him to Adams and recommending us. So. Sydney Marshall, and I'm a junior at Adams High School. Uh, my name is Kenneth Brown, but I go by Kenny. I'm a junior as well at Adams. And do you have any other students with you? Unfortunately not. They all had work, or a lot of them are in rehearsal at the moment. Sure, sure. Well, let's, uh, if, if your two students will come up here, we'll take a picture. Yeah. Please. They're rehearsing hard for Big Band Bash. Thank you. Thank you for coming out Thank tonight. You. And Mr. Seitz, uh, it is you still. Yes, yes. So one before we move on, I did want to give a plug out to the Big Band Bash uh, event this Friday night at Adams High School. What time do we start? Six to ten. Six to ten. Uh, Frankie's Tacos is going to be there, I guess, too. So uh, come on out. It's a it's a really neat event. Um, we have all of our bands and a few of our other schools as well involved with that. So our next uh, honoree, uh, Miss Anna Rosado. Anna, please come up here. So each state, uh, each high school in the state of Indiana is allowed to nominate one graduating senior uh, for the Indiana Academic All-Star Award. Uh, the Indiana Academic All-Star um, Committee then chooses 90 of those students, and then they choose 40. Um, so Anna was one of the top 40 seniors in the state of Indiana based on SAT scores, which I believe you got a perfect on the math. Is that right? Okay. And it was what a seven, 770 on the English. So if you want to get that up. And um, so Anna is also a national merit finalist. Um, finalist for the Presidential Scholar Award and has a soccer scholarship and academic scholarship, right, to uh, Washington University in St. Louis next year. Uh, Anna is the first uh, student from South Bend School since 2016 uh, to win the, to be in the top 40 with the uh, uh, Indian Academic All-Star. So we had a luncheon last weekend, we got to go down, right, with your, with your parents. So uh, I would like to congratulate Anna for that. You want to say a few words? Go ahead. I'm Anna. I obviously didn't plan to speak today, but um, I'm here. Uh, I just want to thank all my teachers, especially. Obviously, I couldn't have done it without them. Um, and thank you for Mr. Seitz's support and for nominating me. Thank you. Okay. Anna, congratulations. Thank you. That's school for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. And before we call all of our principals up, I see uh, District 2 Council. One more. One more. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. no, it's okay. Before we call all of our principals up, I see the District 2 Councilwoman uh, Karen White is with us. And so I want to say uh, thank you for your help and support of the City of South Bend Youth uh, Leadership Program. And I think now we're going to introduce those students. Is that correct? Councilwoman White, before we begin. Um, first, thank you for your support, not only of the 
Riley Girls Group. Thank you for your support of the South Bend Youth Leadership Program. Would you like to say anything? We're so grateful for your support. Uh, thank you so much, Council and Wife, for, for, for joining us tonight. And thank you as well, Dr. Commons, and to uh, the board president, John Anello, and all board members. I'm so pleased to be able to stand before you. I've had the pleasure for a number of years working with uh, students from the South Bend School Corporation, as well as from Mishawaka and uh, St. Joe. The Youth Advisory Council started probably in 2017. Of course, we were faced with COVID, so we had a two year delay, but these are some amazing young people and they have kept me, kept me on my toes. They are energetic, they are so intelligent. And so we meet twice a month. One is engagement where they get opportunity to get to know each other much better than the other one is really getting into the issues of civic engagement, the importance of respect, learning more about government, but most importantly, understanding that they, they do have power, the power of their voices and how to utilize that power effectively. So I don't know how many of the youth council members are here, but I will ask them to come and introduce themselves. And then Dr. Cummins, it will be in your hands. I'm not a district two representative, I'm at large. <laughs> Sorry, okay, no problem. So I'm asking all the youth council members to come forth, share their name and what school they represent. These are my pride and joy. <laughs> I'm Kayla Nicholson and I'm a senior at Clay High School. I'm Alasia Douglas, I'm a junior at Washington. I'm Zoe Nicholson, I'm a senior at Clay High School. I'm Bianca Olin, I'm a senior at Marion. We do have a total of 16 students, but with work and other commitments, they were not able to join us. And Council Mullen, if you'd like to come and take a picture, do we have more students? Is this it? So Councilwoman and the students, if you'd like to come, take a picture. Principals, if you'd like to join us. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Have everyone? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. All right, and now I think I'm at Riley. Oh, one more, Mr. Seitz. So we also have a group of students who were part of the South Bend Mishawaka Youth Leadership. So it's a little bit different, okay. but we'd like to recognize those of students course. as well. So um, I believe we had students from Washington and Riley represented there. So Mr. Uh, Henderson and Mr. Robinson, if you'd like to come up and then the students from those schools as well. So the um, South Bend Mishawaki Youth Leadership Group, the students are nominated by uh, their counselors or their principals. Um, there are about 25 of you guys, that'd be about right. And so they um, meet monthly, they have different project days um, in which they learn about different parts of the community. I believe some of you have actually been involved in the adult leadership program as I'm uh, looking around the, the table. Um, so it's a, it's a similar program to that, uh, just on the youth side. And so it's a very fulfilling uh, a day or a program for all of our students. Um, and they had their graduation three weeks ago, two weeks ago, commencement, I should say. Um, and so we were able to go over and see that. And they also had their, their project. So what I will do is I will introduce the students from uh, Adams High School, and then I will let the other principals come up uh, as well and introduce them. So from Adams High School, a few were not uh, able to be here. Uh, Meredith Anella, uh, Will Michael Carrasco. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. Yep, go stand right over here. Lily Marie Santos Navarro, Ari Shamish, Isaac Schrader, and Janiah Thomas. I don't know if those other ones are here. 
Mr. Yep, come on. Good evening. Um, we also had some amazing students that was able to participate. Um, for those that are not here, I still will announce their name. Uh, Vanessa Plata, class of 2025. Ann Gray, class of 2025. Tori Hardman, class of 2025. Joshua Hardman, class of 2024. Madison Reen, class of 2024. And the young lady that is with us tonight is Katie Wolowski. Olowski, class of 2024. Um, Katie also received a special honor as receiving the earning the Trish Ross Leadership Award um, for being a part of the youth leadership. So that's Riley High School. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Washington High School. Uh, Ms. Delicia Perry is our student here, class of two, 2025. Uh, we are absolutely proud of her just for the simple fact uh, she's smiling because she thought she was about to do a speech. I tried to scare her a little bit. Uh, but we are absolutely proud of her just for her leadership skills. This is just another uh, testimony of the great things that are happening at Washington High School. So we are super proud of her and we're looking forward to coming back to you next year. We have a total of 10 or 11 nominees for next year that we're going to bring forth to this board just based off her efforts and what she's done so far. Thank you. Good. Come on up. Let's take some pictures, everyone. All parents take their photos. Are we bashful? We have them all. All right. Congratulations, everyone. All right, Mr. Henderson, you are still up. Well, thank you all again for having me. Um, I feel like this young man has been before the board a number of times this year. Um, so there is nearly over 400,000 students that are involved in some form of aquatics within high school. Um, 17,000 or more are boys and girls. So approximately 2% of these students are recognized as high school All-Americans, whether they're involving swimming, diving, pool, polo, or just their exemplary student um, achievements that they receive. Riley High School is proud to announce two of them. One of them is not able to be with us tonight, and that's Ms. Al Mr. Alex Knappenberg, who will be attending Purdue University. And then our second is Mr. Cooper Ventries. Cooper, come on up. Cooper has been with us a lot this evening. I believe he may come back every for a few more things. But Cooper is also nominated as, um, or earned the all-American Academic Award, and Cooper will be attending uh, Notre Dame University in the fall. Okay, anything you want to say? Yeah, so this is probably like the fifth time I've talked to you guys this year, and it's always an honor to be here. It's like I'm a pseudo board member at this point, so I, I, I appreciate the recognition that I receive. Um, but like Mr. Anderson said, uh, lots of people are in the sport of swimming. It's an amazing sport. I had the honor of participating in it for a lot, uh, a large part of my life. Uh, and everything I've received from the sport is something I'll look back on for many years to come, uh, not just awards, but people and coaches as well. So I'm very grateful for everything that swimming has given me. That's just one thing I can add to the collection. Again, I'm very appreciative of uh, the National Coach Association that awarded this to me and Alex as well, who cannot be here, but I'm also very excited to be attending Notre Dame next fall. So thank you, board and everybody else. Good. Congratulations. And while while Cooper didn't thank you, Miss Van Der Eich, we, we want to thank you as well. Good seeing everybody again. Good to see you. <laughs>
And now I'd like to ask Mr. Kevin Houck. I thought I saw him. Yep, come on up and uh, share with us the Skills USA competition uh, students and go ahead and bring your students with you. Thank you for having us. Of course, thanks for coming. Hey, uh, I appreciate you having us and giving us this time tonight to recognize these students. Um, Mrs. Russell was not able to be here tonight. She's ill, but she did send a statement I'll read out and then I have a few comments afterwards. Um, I wanted to apologize ahead of time. I'm not feeling real well and it's trouble getting things out clearly sometimes. So bear with me, please. Um, Mrs. Russell, good evening, President Anala, Dr. Cummings and school board members. Tonight, we're recognizing the efforts and success of eight CTE construction students who recently participated in the Skills USA competition at the state level. These eight students formed two teams of four and participated in a contest called Teamworks. In this contest, each team had six hours spread out over two days to build a structure um, complete with masonry, plumbing, and electricity. To prepare for the competition, they met on Saturdays at Riley High School to practice, and we were incredibly fortunate to have a former CTE construction student, Quentin Marvin, volunteer his Saturdays and more to help these students prepare. Only one team, excuse me, only one team from this was able to be sent to the national competition, and only three total teams were chosen for recognition at the state ceremony. One of our groups, led by Daisy, um, placed fourth, and we were incredibly, incredibly proud of them. I was actually, Amanda, the female chaperone of this trip, so I can attest to these students that these students, all eight of them, demonstrated teamwork, grit, and leadership skills. They represented both the CTE program and our school district very well. That was for Amanda. I wanted to add that this competition is uh, an international organization. Um, highly recognized. These students were of 13 in the state that made it to state. Um, so they were one of the top 13 in the state. Uh, this was their first year doing this. The other teams that were there, it was their second year. So this was brand new for them. Uh, they placed, one of our teams placed fourth place. They only uh, recognized one through three, but to be fourth um, in, uh, excuse me, with with such competition was a great, amazing thing. I also wanted to recognize, uh, he was not able to be here, he works, but Quentin Marvin, who was one of my father who taught this class before me's uh, students. And when they did skills, we haven't done Skills USA since COVID, uh, but prior to that, eight years ago, Quentin was on one of the teams that made it all the way to national. You only make it to national if you were first in state. Um, he has been volunteering, <clears throat> He has been volunteering since then, every year, giving up his Saturdays, his work days. He's in the union and a leader. Um, and this year was able to take over for me when I was unable to continue along with it. He dedicated his resources and time to do that. Uh, I also want to recognize the uh, contact board. They were very supportive of, of us and, and helped us in a lot of the financial and other areas. I'd like to take and let just each one of them. We were only able to have four representing both the teams show up today, but I'd like to have them introduce themselves and let you know what part they played on the team. I'm Skylar Folks. I go to Washington and I did electrical. I'm Daisy. I'm a senior at Clay and I was a brick mason. Hi, I'm Olivia Alexander. I'm a senior at Adams and I'm a brick mason. I'm Braylon Johnson. I'm a junior at Adams, and I was an electrician. All right. Congratulations, everyone. Let's uh, make some pictures. Thank you. Congratulations. I have a job for an electrician. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, congratulations. congratulations. Time to get everyone's pictures. 
Everybody got, got all of them? Good. Congratulations, everyone. Now, Assistant Superintendent of Academics, Dr. Brandon White, uh, will come and introduce the Armstrong Teacher Educator Awardee, Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. Cummings, Mr. Anella, School Board of Trustees, good evening. I have the privilege of um, congratulating um, Mrs. Janae Hartman, teacher at Clay High School, for her selection as a 2023-2024 Armstrong Teacher Educator for the Indiana University School of Education. The award recognizes outstanding teachers across Indiana with the intent to bring awardees to the IU Bloomington campus to interact with their students and faculty through a variety of interactions and opportunities. I don't know if there's Mrs. Hartman here this evening, but, uh, but, we, but we still wanted to acknowledge this amazing opportunity for her. Thank you. And our last two announcements, uh, the School City Compact has a committee that's made up of superintendent appointees, students, and other community members. Those applications will be online beginning Wednesday. We will send out a press release. It'll be on all of our social media accounts on how to apply. So if you're interested, please make sure that you look for the press release and all of our social media um, pages. Our next school board meeting will be on May 15, 2023. We'll be doing our years of service that evening. And so we will have a location as we determine it. And so, uh, Ms. Ranella, that is the end of recognitions and superintendent announcements. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Uh, so that brings us to our academic focus this evening. Um, and we have a presentation from Dr. Uh, Davian Lewis of the South Bend Empowerment Zone. And see a lot of cameras, so a lot of people are anxious to hear what you have to say this evening, so we're happy you're here, and uh, we'll, we'll turn the floor over to you, and uh, thank you very much. All yours. All right. Uh, to uh, uh, President Anella, Superintendent Dr. Cummings, uh, members of the uh, trustees, uh, to our students, families who are with us here in person as well as virtually, uh, good evening. It is uh, uh, my pleasure to come before you uh, this afternoon, this evening rather, and provide an update on the uh, state of the empowerment zone. Uh, before I uh, begin, I do want to take a quick moment to uh, uh, recognize and acknowledge the uh, Board of Directors of the Empowerment Zone, many of whom are here with us today, including our Board President, Mr. Sam Santeas, Mr. Jeff Ray, Mr. Ryan Mathis, Ms. Sonia Watkins, Mr. Dwayne Wilson, our uh, SBCSC appointed board members, Ms. Karima Fowler, uh, Ms. Stephanie Ball, Mrs. Uh, Leslie Wesley, and also Ms. Uh, Rosa Highstand. Um, uh, to your benefit, rather, you will not just be hearing my voice this evening. I have some amazing uh, members of my uh, senior leadership team who will be with us, uh, including uh, Mrs. Varissa Davis, Ms., uh, who serves as Executive Director of Student Services, Ms. Rhonda Ross, our Executive Director for Business Services, uh, Ms. Roxana Zapata, our Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, and also joining us is uh, Ms. Julia Tao, our uh, Chief of Staff. Uh, I do want to start off with uh, a quick uh, housekeeping item. So uh, those of you who would have seen the uh, presentation in Board Docs, it is a long presentation, but I am not going to go through all the slides. Uh, last year, uh, uh, the state of the zone uh, took approximately, approximately 47 minutes. I intend uh, to be that time this evening, so we will, I'm uh, being time, Mr. Arnella, I will uh, skip through some slides and gloss over others. I also want to set expectations on how we are going to spend our time uh, this evening. Uh, it is my intention that... Uh, 
at the time we leave this evening, we'd have answered any and all questions about the empowerment zone. This report is a uh, uh, comprehensive, holistic, uh, transparent report. I am not here this evening to uh, provide a sales pitch on the empowerment zone one way or another, nor am I here to make a case. I have seen empowerment zones work. I've seen them not work. Uh, and I think with the right opportunity, uh, the empowerment zone here in South Bend could be a phenomenal one. But again, I am not here uh, to make a sales pitch. I am simply going to provide a transparent report. And uh, uh, this board, as well as the board of directors, uh, how you use the data from tonight's report is entirely up to you. So I often uh, tell folks, you know, we are in the pursuit of progress, not perfection, that uh, today is better than yesterday and tomorrow is better than today. And that is, in essence, the story of the empowerment zone, a story of progress uh, over time, not yet where we'd like to be, but have made significant progress in a variety of different areas. So I won't go through this slide, but this is a recap of how we got started. The zone was approved in March 2019 and was up and running five months later. And despite uh, you know, popular um, thought, uh, the MOU for the empowerment zone actually does not contain uh, benchmarks or uh, goals. In fact, any reference of uh, deliverables or benchmarks or goals are seen in the uh, State Board of Education approved plan. That plan lists specifically three deliverables that had to be achieved by the end of year three, and they are listed here before you. Uh, I'm happy to say that those deliverables have been met. What we do see benchmarks and goals is also in the uh, uh, State, Board of, uh, State Board of Education approved application. Uh, the benchmarks are three. Uh, they are increasing the percentage of students who are proficient, decreasing the percentage of students who are at the bottom placement levels or the bottom quartile, and improving overall growth. However, and this is a strong however, uh, the goals that are associated with those benchmarks were based on the I-STEP assessment. And as I'm sure we are all aware, the I-STEP was last done in 2018. And so the plan as it was created uh, could not have predicted the context, uh, which we all saw with the introduction of the iLearn assessment. So drastic was the dip in student performance statewide that uh, the legislature passed Senate Bill 2, basically making the results for 2019 and 2020 meaningless. Who would have thought that in February when the governor signed uh, Senate Bill 2, making it law that uh, three and a half weeks later, he would declare a state of emergency and sending everyone home as a result of the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. And so here we are today. Now, when I took this appointment in August, I was very excited at the opportunity, uh, having met various board members and I, got here and met with uh, staff and parents and various stakeholders, including IDOE. And what I often heard about was this idea that we are pursuing this continuous improvement of these schools on the West side. And uh, the, those words really resonate for me as a certified lead evaluator for Cognia, previously Advanced Ed, previously SACS, which is the world's largest accreditation body, Continuous improvement is what I do. And so I would often have to go into schools and entire school districts and lead or participate in their accreditation review. And this is the framework that we used, continuous improvement. And as you see here is a continuum from engagement to embeddedness, initiate to impact. And we look at schools and school districts through these three particular domains, leadership, learning, and resources. We'll talk a little bit about that. So. The leadership uh, domain includes things like goals, accountability, people, and processes. And let me just uh, pause for a quick second here for the 
uh, uh, benefit of folks who are in the audience as well as who are um, uh, with us, the full presentation is available on Board Docs. So through so true is um, an appendix for any materials referenced in today's uh, presentation. When we think about the learning domain, we think about uh, equity, culture, instruction. And when we think about resources, we think about utilization, development, and infrastructure. And this is how we look at how schools are doing as a system to determine whether or not they ought to be accredited. And so thinking about the empowerment zone for the current school year, I'll start off by talking a little bit about the leadership domain. So coming into this year, uh, recognizing gaps, we introduced a whole host of new standard operating procedures. They included manuals, processes, policies. Uh, we doubled down on what it means to have an effective PLCs. And we spent a lot of investment in uh, targeted tier differentiated ongoing teacher professional development. Uh, a big focus of mine was the partnership between the zone and the district. Let me be clear, we are not in competition with the district. The zone is uh, one of various uh, uh, offerings that make up the uh, uh, cadre of the district. We are part of the district portfolio. So we work in partnership, not in competition. And so I spent a lot of time making sure that we would do things to not just have communication and collaboration, but to move towards true uh, partnership. Uh, I sit on uh, Dr. Cummings' uh, uh, cabinet, which meets weekly on Tuesdays, and then he and I have a separate one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, bi-weekly. And then I made sure that each of the leaders on our side were meeting with their counterparts on the district side so that we could have true uh, partnership. We also worked very aggressively to uh, increase both the capacity and engagement of our board members, starting with a board metrics to figure out where we had gaps and then uh, recruiting some additional board members. Now, research will show that uh, one of the single greatest indicators uh, for school turnaround and lasting school turnaround is uh, the building leadership, the, the principal. And so we've been very intentional about making sure that we've been building the capacity of our uh, building level principals to ensure that they are truly owning and embracing their role as the instructional leaders of their buildings. We've also spent time in the leadership domain uh, developing uh, our teachers and staff and introduce a number of things like grade level chairs, department chairs, um, teacher mentorship, so on and so forth. Our families are a key ingredient. And so while it's great to have family involvement or even family engagement, the ultimate goal is family partnership, that they are a part of the process. And so uh, between October through March, I think I hosted a little over a dozen town hall meetings, both in person uh, and virtually. But to ensure that our families can fulfill their roles as a partner in this process, we needed to build their capacity. And these were a number of things that we did and continue to do to build the capacity of our parents. So, the principals and folks on the leadership team will tell you I have uh, all but three rules. First, keep kids safe. Second, follow the law. Third, no surprises. And coming in this school year, we were surgical in identifying areas where we had gaps and we worked aggressively towards addressing those gaps. So, that in the places we were already in compliance, we'd be even in better compliance. And in the places where we had work to do, we would get in compliance. And so these are a number of areas um, that we've worked towards that. But I'll speak a little bit around diverse learners as it is indicative of the work um, that we've done around our efforts to be uh, compliant. And so uh, since uh, December, uh, after having made a number of programmatic policy personnel changes, in the last 90 days, 
we have in, uh, significantly increased um, our compliance in diverse learners. Each of our buildings now have a fully certified teacher of record, uh, and we have cut the number of uh, evals that are pending uh, by over 50%. And again, here are some other examples. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Zapata, to talk a little bit about the learning domain. Good evening. Good evening. I'll be speaking about the learning domain with a few examples. Here are some examples of increased accountability uh, that we've embedded over this year. We adopted a new framework for teaching and learning that is centered and focused on the equitable and engaging learning experiences that we seek for every student in every classroom. Academic growth is of course tied to high quality curricular resources and materials. And a few examples of what we've done this year, uh, we developed and implemented a curriculum review process, which provided teacher leaders with voice and the ability to engage in decision-making as they investigated, piloted, evaluated various curricular materials and came up with recommendations in the areas of ELA, uh, English language arts, as well as science and literacy intervention. Another area we were invited um, to be part of the IDOE literacy cadre, as we know that supporting uh, curricular changes and curricular resources is, is essential. Um, we are excited that IDOE will be uh, funding uh, over $200,000 for the next two years with a focus on early literacy skills, foundational reading skills, and, and a focus on kindergarten through second grade. We have mapped our curriculum and instruction as well as assessment so that there's vertical alignment across the tiers where we have core instruction and we're intentionally considering what interventions support core instruction in tiers two and intensive intervention for tier three, as well as what assessments align to those uh, curricular materials and resources to ensure that we are engaging in progress monitoring that is ongoing and can inform decisions for our students. We collect data as well as utilize data to inform our decisions. And we've done so in various ways, structuring opportunities for deep, da deep data dives with school leaders, uh, engaging in promotion and doubt conversations based on data and looking at evidence and progress uh, to make decisions for those students, as well as K-12 lift, which I'll be speaking to on the next slide. We're really excited about the K-12 LIFT partnership. Um, we are the first in the state to be engaging in this initiative. K-12 LIFT um, is a pilot that IDOE is invested in, $300,000 for uh, two years of supports, engaging in looking at data, and we'll, we'll take a look at the data in, in a little bit, but looking at data with visualizations that provide additional context more than we've had before, and allowing us to serve as an incubator for the state, um, specifically as we look at statewide data practices in school turnaround uh, across Indiana. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Davis. So here you can see the progress we've made in student growth by reducing discipline referrals by 30%, boosting family participation on our quarterly surveys by 82%, and enhancing teacher engagement by 81%. Progress has also been achieved by assessing teacher engagement. And although we've conducted exit interviews to identify areas for improvement, it is often too late by that time. And so last month, we initiated conducting stay interviews to understand why our teachers are staying and how we can leverage those factors. So enabling students to cultivate habits of mind is also part of our progress. Our director of student wellness is responsible for leading this charge along with other items listed in that big blue bubble. Our upcoming Westside Refresh Mental Health Fair, which is scheduled for this Saturday, May 6th at Washington High School, is one of the highlights of their work. And listed here, you can see opportunities provided for students in the domains of enrichment, leadership, partnership, and talent exposure. We've also made the decision to cease the practice of merely advancing students to the next grade level. Our promotion and doubt program initiated in January and our summer bridge program beginning in June aims to provide additional support to students and ensure their academic growth and success. 
And the increases and decreases shown here are the results of progress we've made through our programs and our practices. Listed here, you'll see some of the college and career readiness opportunities that we've offered our students this academic year. And I'd like to highlight the Holy Cross Cross and Anchor Leadership Program, which is designed for rising ninth graders. It is a week long program that takes place in July. And through the program, students can immerse themselves in college in the college experience by residing on campus, participating in college level courses and honing their leadership skills all without any cost. So next, I will hand over the floor to Ms. Rhonda Ross, who will cover the topic of resources. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Good evening, my name is Rhonda Ross. I'm the Executive Director of Business Services and General Counsel for The Zone. I'm pleased to report on how The Zone has harnessed and improved its use of staff and financial resources to affect better outcomes organization-wide. To start, this year we made progress in strengthening communication across leadership teams and departments. Here you can see the cadence of our group and one-to-one -one meetings, all of which are designed to capture the power of our people resources in order to improve organizational effectiveness. Organizational effectiveness includes how we operate and streamline so we can spend time on what matters. This graphic highlights that principles are at the core of our distributive leadership model. They are provided autonomy to make decisions in the best interest of our students. They are supported in their capacity by way of coaching and support. This leads to accountability where leaders are held accountable for their actions. Our people, especially our school-based staff, are a tremendous resource and we've created structures to invest in their development, including ongoing professional envelop development taking place each Thursday on early release days, new to the zone this year. Other investments include supporting and developing emergency permit staff, capacity building of teacher leaders by offering department and grade level chair positions, as well as aspiring teacher fellow positions to build teacher efficacy. Lastly, zone sponsored CPR, suicide prevention and anti-sexual harassment training has taken place this year. Now, moving on to our financial resources management, we operate our financial decision-making processes within the following framework. We shall uphold our fiduciary duty to be good stewards of public funds. We practice strategic resource management to ensure sustainability of the organization and improve student outcomes. Before continuing, I'd like to take a moment to discuss how the zone is funded. So whether a student leaves an SBCS school to go to a zone school, a neighboring district, or a charter school, the funding travels with that student. As a designated transformation zone, the zone receives state and federal funding that helps the zone maintain a higher per pupil investment. Some funds like the PRI grant may not otherwise be available to non-transformation zone schools. So our perceived additional expenditures are largely covered by these additional revenue resources. Since August, 2022, we've been focused on building our operational and financial systems to increase savings, accountability, transparency, and stronger systems. As new executives in the zone, both Dr. Lewis and I quickly realized we needed more sustainable structures and systems in place. Just as urgent was the need to satisfy the desires from stakeholders for more transparency. With this in mind, we completed and published a three-year historical financial analysis and forecast, which was presented at our September 22 board meeting. A copy of that report is available on our website and in the appendix attached to this presentation. In terms of cost savings, we have reduced 22-23 school year spending by $2.3 million. This was a result of reductions in staff levels, vendor contracts, and streamlining purchasing accounts. For the upcoming school year, we project a spending reduction of $3 million. This will be achieved by a conservative balanced budget. A draft was presented in this month's public board meeting transportation route consolidation, potentially yielding over $750,000 in savings, and continued right-sizing of our staff, as well as salary realignment with the district. As for increased accountability and transparency, 
We've increased our alignment with the district's internal controls and systems. For example, over 99% of our purchases go through the district's PO system. Our 501c3 operating funds are overseen by our external CPA firm partners and are reviewed by the zone board monthly. To add our operation funds, annual audits have been cleaned with no findings of material misstatement for the past three years. In addition to enhanced internal controls listed here, we have also made progress in building stronger partnerships, starting with the hire of a dedicated director of partnership development during this past school year. We are pleased to inform that our partnerships this past school year have yielded over $450,000 in benefits. As you can see from above, the zone has improved its use of people and financial resources to continuously improve and achieve better outcomes. Up next, we will discuss results. Thank you. So this, so this slide shows our pre-pandemic attendance rates, which slips in line with local, state, and national COVID level attendance rates. And as you can see, we are beginning to make progress towards pre-academic, excuse me, pre-pandemic rates. And across the board, we've seen double digit decreases in office referrals, which are down 22%, in school suspensions down 62%, and out of school suspensions down 18%. We'll now look at some of the academic data. And just as a reminder here, the three benchmarks that Dr. Lewis mentioned earlier uh, that were part of the zone plan since the inception. We're going to look at iReady end of year data for our third through eighth graders. Uh, this, this was uh, taken at the end of March, mid to late March, uh, prior to spring break. As Dr. Lewis came into the zone, uh, he was surprised to realize we did not use common formative assessments and uh, strategically adjusted our iReady testing windows. Uh, for end of year for third graders through eighth graders who would be testing in iLearn so that we could have information going into spring break that was current and allowed us to make some uh, really targeted strategic interventions in the weeks prior to and as we started the iLearn season. We're going to be talking about three areas that align perfectly with the benchmarks that were, were set previously and that we just saw. Um, for third through eighth graders specifically. The number of third to eighth grade students that are on grade level or above grade level increased more than two times from fall to spring in reading and increased fivefold in math. When we look at students in the lower categories of placement levels or that have the most significant gaps, there are 184 fewer students that are two or more years below grade level in reading and that number is 202 fewer students in math. And when we look at growth set by the iReady platform, annual typical growth goals that each student is targeted and identified to have, although there were eight weeks less instruction than typical end of year windows, in reading 48% of our students met or exceeded their annual typical growth goal in reading and 37% of students met or exceeded it in math. Here we can take a look by school at third through eighth grade proficiency or looking at reading on grade level or above grade level across our schools and the overall zone. And you can see the growth uh, reflected in the green in, this, uh, in the spring category, the end of year data. Here we see the same reading data for on or above grade level disaggregated by subgroup. Progress for on grade level and percentage of students on grade level or above grade level also is noted here by school for math and by subgroup for math in the at or above grade level categories. Now, when we look at students two or more grade levels below, we measure progress by looking at the decrease of the percent of students in the categories or those placement levels two or more grade levels below. And we can see in reading across schools, the, the progress or growth 
through the decreases in percentage of students in spring. And we can see that with the subgroup data for reading and the percentage of students that are two or more grade levels below. The same for math, by school, two or more grade levels below and the decreases across the board. And the decreases here in the percent of students who are more grade levels below for math disaggregated by subgroup. We talked a little bit about K-12 lift and it provides us with a new view, a new lens uh, and some context to look at iReady student growth. And we'd like to share some more information through this video with you. Pablo, Camila, and Lulu. These three students live in different regions of the world. They are all the same age and are all in the same grade in school. Several times each school year, Pablo, Camila, and Lulu run a timed race. The goal is to measure the distance that they are able to cover within the time frame. This year, Pablo engaged in practice five days a week with his team coach. When it was time for the race, Pablo made progress. Pablo, his coach, and his family all celebrated Pablo's progress. Camila also put in work and had some additional support. She practiced five days a week with her team coach and also had training with her personal trainer. This helps build her muscles and agility, which helped increase her speed. When Camila ran the race, she ran even farther than Pablo did in the same amount of time. Camila, her coach, her personal trainer, and her family all celebrated Camila's progress. Finally, we have Lulu. Lulu had a strenuous training regimen and an entire team of professionals who were dedicated to preparing her for the run. She practiced five days a week with her team coach and also had three days of weight training with her personal trainer. Additionally, Ulu had a sports nutritionist who made sure she was receiving the proper nutrients she needed for optimal performance and recovery. She had weekly sessions with her dedicated sports psychologist who helped with motivation and stress management. Furthermore, she had regular checkups with her doctor to ensure that her body was functioning at maximum capacity. If it wasn't, her doctor used the science of medicine to help her stay in alignment so that she could perform to her full potential. As you can imagine, when Lulu ran the race, she ran even farther than Pablo and Camila in the same amount of time. Time after time, Year after year, the same thing happened. Pablo made minimal movement, Camila made a bit more movement, but Lulu covered a greater distance in the same amount of time. As a result, the distance between Pablo, Camila, and Lulu continued to grow. When we look at the three of them in context, we can see how their running ranks in terms of their same aged peers across the country. We can celebrate each of them for working hard and growing, but where do they fall in their performance compared to others? The same scenario plays out in our schools year after year. Our students come to school. They work hard. They learn. We celebrate their growth. But when we zoom out and look at their growth on a national scale, we see that sometimes they are not keeping up with their national peers. In fact, since they were already behind, the chasm between where they are and where others in their grade levels are continues to widen. If Pablo keeps making the same amount of progress he made this year, he will never catch up to Lulu. If Camila keeps making the same amount of progress she made this year, she will never catch up to Lulu. We need to reflect on and change what we do in their training and development so that they can make up ground. 
The same goes for our students. We need to accelerate their learning, making sure that the rate of learning is on pace with their peers, or if they are not yet proficient, that the growth rate is accelerated and that they are learning quickly enough to become proficient in reading and math and all content areas, acquiring and applying the knowledge identified for their grade level to compete on a global level. Together and informed by data, we will make this happen. With that information in mind, we'll look at some data. This is a visualization that allows us to look at all grade levels, as well as both subject areas that are tested and iReady. And we're able to see and compare to national peers using percentiles. Being right down the middle, that at, at zero on the scale is actually keeping up with peers. National percentile ranking is uh, remains the same. And that's the kind of learning that lets us know that we're on pace to learn a year's material in a year's time. When we look at the accelerated growth that we often are trying to achieve to ensure that students are growing quickly enough to reach proficiency, we want those pink bars pushing to the right as they are so that students are gaining ground and their percentile ranking is actually increasing when we compare their learning rate to the rate of other students across the country taking iReady. The last piece that I'd like to focus on here is the exclamation points. Those exclamation points let us know where that grade level in that subject area landed or were last year. And across the board in every grade level and across both subject areas, those exclamation points are well below where we are this year and show an increase in each area improvement. Here we can look at SMART goal one, which is being on pace to learn a year's material in a year's time, comparing middle of year on the left, you can see in those three columns, middle of year to end of year, and the difference in the shaded column um, right next to that. You can see the, the difference in many of the categories is green so that we're increasing the percentage of students that are learning a year's material or on pace to learn a year's material in a year's time. In the center columns, you'll see the same for SMART goal two, which is, are they growing quickly enough? The percentage of students that are accelerating their rate of growth in a way to reach proficiency is, is uh, what's being captured. And you can see middle of the year to end of year and the difference uh, improvement in the shaded areas in the center. And on the right-hand side, you can see the percentage of students that are on pace to be proficient on iLearn based on how uh, the iReady data through K-12 lift visualizations is linked to uh, and projects iLearn proficiency. And you can see middle of year to end of year, as well as the difference in that last column. Here, you can see the same format the same goals and percentage of students. However, it's last year's end of year data that was assessed or collected at the end, mid to late May. And our assessment this year for third through eighth graders, which was done mid to late March. And you can see in SMART goal one, in SMART goal two, and then uh, for proficiency on pace for proficiency on iLearn, the difference between last year and this year with many of the categories across subjects and across grade levels showing double digit uh, growth and increases in percentage points. So this slide shows that since the initiation of our promotion and doubt interventions that started in February, the total number of disciplinary behaviors for PID students have decreased. 81.3% uh, in suspensions and 45.5% in office referrals. We've also seen the average attendance for PID students increase from 78% to 81% overall, with Navarre students making the largest increase. And to note, Navarre specifically targeted students with low attendance for their promotion and doubt interventions. And this last slide here 
Additionally, for PID students, we observed a 21% decrease in the number of students three or more grade levels below and a 96% increase in the number of students one grade level below from the middle of the year to the end of year testing. Thank you. So as we head into home stretch, and I promise you we are heading into home stretch, I'll talk a little bit about lessons learned. So while autonomy is important for any zone to be successful, more than just having autonomy is the right types of autonomy. And some of the lessons we learned this past year is essentially what are the things that we need autonomy on in order to move the needle for kids to really learn. And in that similar vein, we learned what are the things that we really don't need autonomy on to really move the needle. Uh, whether or not uh, a new employee does background check through us or the district, it doesn't move the needle for kids. And so having an entirely separate HR team, having an entirely separate finance system, so on and so forth, uh, is only not sustainable financially, but it doesn't directly impact student outcomes. And so those are things that we've learned that we don't need autonomy over. But what are the things that we do need autonomy and flexibility around? Curriculum and instruction, programmatic implementation, talent management, independent spending thresholds, and transportation. And a lot of these things have been a key ingredient to the progress and the continuous improvement that we've been able to share with you just now in our results. Now, research will show that a key function of a transformation zone is to serve as an incubator, to pilot a variety of things that can positively impact the larger system. And we have some examples of that here in South Bay. Um, statewide, uh, we were uh, very uh, pleased when uh, IGOE reached out to me to ask to serve as a consultant for their statewide school support and improvement framework. And I provided lots of feedback, which they're now implementing, including piloting that framework uh, with, with our empowerment zone, and I believe Evansville and uh, some schools in Indianapolis. We've also seen a number of areas here that the zone uh, has either already piloted and or is piloting that has informed uh, decision-making on the district side. So whether it's been around the student code of conduct, and I believe we're now in a process where there's a crosswalk and we're looking at the wider uh, code of conduct or clear backpacks, uh, Dr. White and I uh, partnered on FEV Tutor. As you might be aware, the zone was the first to implement iReady, which the district has since uh, implemented, uh, so on and uh, so forth. And here is a quick example um, affirming what I've just talked about. And we, we find as a case study in uh, Tennessee where schools that were not a part of a transformation zone having been on the state takeover list looked to its neighbors in the transformation zone, looked at the lessons that they learned, implemented those lessons, and have since uh, been removed from the state takeover list in Tennessee. So quickly, some investments in the future. As we move forward, we plan to make uh, nine investments uh, in, in various areas, both across the zone and at the school level. At the zone level, we are looking at doing a multi-year strategic plan. We are looking to continue to invest in decision-making processes um, to help uh, build the capacity of our board. Uh, and most importantly, we are looking to continue to address uh, mindsets to improve the culture of our buildings. Uh, believe it or not, uh, at the beginning of the year, there were some folks who thought these kids can't learn. You know, that, that's a troubling mindset to be working in a school. And we've been very diligent in addressing those mindsets. Uh, same is true for the idea of a classroom teacher versus a school teacher. And we continue to focus on addressing these particular habits of mind. We talked a little bit about our continued improvement in our data practices, starting with K-12 Lyft, and we continue uh, to look at that as we move forward. Vertical programmatic alignment. Um, we've been very intentional about that, and so as we move forward, 
Um, we uh, are, were a part of the facilities master planning process, and which has forced us to think through our natural feeder patterns for our schools, as well as making sure that our um, schools are aligned uh, with a larger district process. And so we are pleased to say that um, at Navarre, as an example, this year's sixth graders, by the time they leave Navarre, will have the opportunity to earn up to five high school credits, including biology right? Because the vast majority of our students, when they leave Navarre, are going to Washington, which has a medical magnet program. We've never been intentional about that before. That's something that we're beginning to do now. Again, that vertical alignment. We are partners with the district. We are not competing with the district. Uh, as Dr. Cummings spoke about earlier in his uh, remarks, uh, just last week, our community experienced trauma. And Several students in zone schools uh, witnessed and or were friends with that young man, and those families are also experiencing trauma. And one of the things that we want to do as we move forward is to be very intentional about using a trauma-informed lens in our practices, but also recognizing and supporting the trauma that our teachers have experienced as well. I don't think we do a good enough job at that. We continue to focus on elevating the student voice, focusing on enrichment and opportunities for acceleration, and building community and belongingness, which is another reason that we're moving towards our natural feeder systems. It's different when you have students attending a school that all come from the same community versus when you have students from five or six different elementary schools across an entire city coming into one middle school. We continue to focus on building an ecosystem. I often say that schools are a microcosm of communities. And so whatever is happening in a community, it's going to play out in a school. And so just as how in a community, you need a vast array of community resources, you need similarly a vast array of resources in our schools. And last um, and most importantly, nothing replaces the teacher. No software, no program, nothing replaces the teacher. We've been very, very clear that our teachers are our number one resource and our most valued possession. And so we want to continue to ensure that we are doing things to address teacher wellness, to address their retention, and to ensure their longevity. So what's next? And I'm sure that's the question that most people have. What's next? So in terms of what's next, uh, again, despite uh, misperceptions that might be out there, the current MOU for the zone automatically renews for a term of five years, unless in the first bullet, one of these things happen as an example, the zone were to file for bankruptcy, then, which we know from our financials report, that's not going to happen. Secondly, the zone board and the district board were to agree to mutually end the zone. Um, I certainly don't want to speak for my board, but uh, I don't have any, any indication at this point that that is their intention to do so. Or third, the Board of Trustees, SBCSC, were to take action against the zone for material cause. And I believe there are some examples in the MOU that, that state to that. But even so, I want to be clear that the MOU also delineates uh, the remedies for that, including the zone would have to get 90 days to respond to the accusation of cause, mediation, and it also would need to be approved by State Board of Education. Now, Dr. Cummings and myself, as I mentioned, we uh, talk just about weekly on a variety of topics, including what could happen with the zone. Uh, uh, ourselves, as well as both our board presidents have met um, on at least two occasions. Uh, this afternoon, I met in executive session with uh, the SBCSC uh, trustees. Uh, both external councils for the zone and the district have been in contact regarding uh, various scenarios. And I think we can consider today's presentation as the formal kickoff for discussing the future of the zone. On May 9th, the zone will host a uh, public forum at 6 p.m. at Navarre Middle School. Uh, where we invite stake stakeholders to come and share their perspectives on what should or shouldn't happen um, as we co uh, continue to explore the future of the zone. 
uh, on May 15th, uh, the zone board will meet with the SBCSC trustees in its, in its executive session. On May 16th, uh, the zone board will discuss publicly um, different considerations. Uh, ongoing conversations will happen through June 20th. Um, we believe at this point in time that the SBCSC trustees will uh, potentially discuss and take action on the MOU at its June 21st meeting. And at its June 26th meeting, the zone board of directors will uh, vote to ratify said action. And so this is the last slide. And so as um, we close, I, I like to end with where I begin around this idea of uh, uh, continuous improvement. And as we've demonstrated uh, in this presentation today, there've been areas where we've made great progress. There've been areas where we've made little progress. There've been areas, quite frankly, where we've not made enough progress. And it's um, not pleasing to any of us. That being said, this is a, a cycle of continuous improvement and we continue uh, to go down that path. The questions often asked of me, and I get it almost weekly, well, what do I think um, should happen to the zone? Uh, a, uh, it's not my choice. What will happen, that's a decision well above my pay grade. It will happen between both boards. Uh, and I said earlier, I'm not here to sell the idea of the zone or to make a case for it. That's ultimately a decision that you all will make using the data that I've provided today. I've seen zones work, they can work. I've also seen zones not work. I would encourage uh, the board and members of the public as we continue this dialogue to use this as an opportunity to get it right. This isn't about me or this team here. Uh, I'm going to be okay, regardless of what happens. When I got here in August, it was with the understanding that this was a a two-year contract. And until such time that I'm told otherwise, that's the timeline that I'm operating with. So I'm not advocating for an extension for my own career or anything like that. Again, I'm going to be fine. This is about the students and what we think we need to do in the best interest of our students. They have greater needs and require additional interventions. And if the body believes that a transformation zone, whether in its current iteration or a modified version of the current iteration is the best thing to do, then that's what we should do. Whatever the decision, I want to be super clear, I will execute that decision faithfully and successfully. So if the decision is to reintegrate the schools, I will do that and I will do it well. If the decision is to continue, I will also do that. And I will do that well, because again, it's not about me. So I encourage both boards to, again, think of this as an opportunity. We've, we've talked about not having enough stakeholder input four years ago when the state kind of swooped in and said, you don't have a choice. This is an opportunity to have greater stakeholder input. This is an opportunity to do all the things that we wished we had done in retrospect. Hindsight is 2020, and it's very easy to Monday morning quarterback use this as an opportunity to get it right. But ultimately, whatever the body decides, I will execute faithfully and successfully. And so with that, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And I didn't keep a timer, but you did a great job. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure board members would have questions or comments. Uh, if any board members uh, have questions or comments at this time, I do. Yes, Ms. McCullough. Let me say this. Thank you for your presentation. I'm looking at page 69. And as an educator, I'm always interested in this increase in students' academics. So am I, when I'm looking at this, am I looking at this correctly? There's been no growth as far as uh, improvement. This, this many kids are still below grade level. Are we talking the one that I have on the board now? Yes. Okay, uh, great question. So the data that you're looking at are students who are what we call promotion endowed. So these students were identified as being on track to not being promoted to the next grade. So what we talked about earlier is that we're no longer gonna continue the practice of just 
promoting kids when they haven't earned that promotion. And we implemented this targeted intervention called promotion in doubt. And students could get promotion in doubt for one of three in one of three areas, academics, attendance, or behavior. And so the two slides prior to this, you see that the students that were promotion in doubt for attendance had increased attendance. The students that were promotion in doubt for discipline improved their uh, behavior in particular for the students that are promotion in doubt for academics. And there was a 21% decrease in specifically the subgroup of PID students uh, by 21%. And then we increased by moving students from three grade levels, two grade levels below, up to one grade level below by 96%. But again, this is specifically the subgroup of PID students. And I believe across the zone, we had just under 200 students that were PID across the entire school. Okay, so let me go to another sheet here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let me try page 53. So I'm looking at page 53. And I think you might have broken this down, but I'm not quite sure. Yep. So when I look at question number one, you have this bunch together. So I'm particularly interested in knowing how many kids in grade three, so forth, has passed the IRE scores. So okay. that that great question. So that data is on the next set of slides. So what you have here on that first page is a high level summary of our end of year iReady assessment data. The next set of slides is the same data that's disaggregated, right? So we have it by school, we have it overall. So if you look at this slide, what this shows in your specific, specifically to your question around the first point, number of students that are increasing uh, in proficiency, we grew that from 8% to 18% across the zone by uh, from fall to spring 23 on the I ready. Right. Okay, so you said, so in Coquillet. Yes. Grade three. This is uh, three through five, so we don't have it I'm, right. You, I'm looking, you, you, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You have this in a whole group of kids. Yes, ma'am. I'm not looking at the whole group of kids. I wanna know how many kids at Coquillet in third grade uh, pass your I-step, fourth grade pass your I-step, fifth grade and so forth. Yes, because when you have it grouped together like this, this is still not very high. Mm -hmm. When you have a uh, grade three to, through, how, how does it go up to sixth grade? Uh, Coquillet is three through five. Three through five. So this is still three through five is not still a high number as far as I'm concerned. But let me just move on. And we'll be happy to get the disaggregated data by grade level to you. Okay. So what I want to say is, is that last week, last board meeting, I read um, some, some things. This is just a comment, not, not a, I read some things that, that, that um, is happening in the zone. The zone, um, the thing, same things that are happening in the zone very intentionally should be happening in this school district very intentionally. So what the zone is doing in their schools to make sure their kids are progressing, we should be doing the same thing here. So in my opinion, the zone, I wasn't on the board when the zone was formed. I know why it was formed. It was only for one school, four of the schools were put in there. In my opinion, the zone should never have been started. It should never have been developed. We should have been intentionally working with the Narvar Middle School kids to make sure that they were progressing. We should be intentionally working with and supplying the same resources that the zone is talking about with the other schools in this district. We should be intentionally, since that's the word everybody likes to, like to hear, very intentional, working with these schools and our corporation to make sure that those kids are progressing. We shouldn't have a separate group of kids over here in a separate group of five schools over here separated from the school district. And why that's happening is very, very wrong, in my opinion. You have cut off a whole group of kids and you separated them in a zone. What is a zone? A transformational zone? A zone. What does that term mean? We should have our kids should be in this corporation and they should be learning the same things that this zone schools are saying that they're teaching. We can do the same thing here. 
to me, this is an extra cost that we should not be capped with. We keep saying that we're losing money. We don't have money. We can't fix up clay. We couldn't fix up this school. So you want to close this school down. So the same thing that we're doing in this zone, paying principals, assistant principals, directors, we should, we should bring those schools back and pay those same kids and those same teachers out of the same budget. We shouldn't have a separate budget. This is wrong, people. This is wrong, separating kids. It's wrong. It's wrong. As I've been reminded a million times, I'm only one vote, one board member, one vote. But I have my opinion. And again, this zone should never have been formed. That's my comment. Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes, Ms. Lee. On the students that were promotion in doubt, I'm just curious as a parent who's been a South Bend Schools parent, how did how did you talk to parents about that? Because I know that's been a, that's been a challenge as my kids are going through school, they had classmates who when when that conversation was had with parents, that's a hard conversation to have. So how were you successful in that? And did you get pushback from parents? Uh, great question. So uh, we were super intentional about making sure that the promotion in doubt was just not a conversation, but it resulted in an action plan so that students had very clear, specific goals that if they met those goals, they would then be eligible for promotion at the end of the year. If students did not meet the goals in that action plan, uh, the, the next layer of intervention was mandatory summer school. And then if they didn't complete the expectations of summer school, they will automatically uh, will be retained. And the only way to no longer be retained is through uh, a, uh, an appeal from the parent, um, an, a, a retention appeal uh, request made by the parent in writing. Um, what we found was that for some parents, it was informative. They didn't realize that their students had X number of suspensions or X number of um, uh, missed school days. And so it was an opportunity uh, to collaborate on what would go into the action plans. So our uh, building leaders and teachers did not go in to those PID conversations saying, here, this is what you must do to become eligible for promotion. It was, these are the issues. You've been suspended X number of times. You have 60 absences. And as you see at Navarre, um, the vast majority of those students that were PID were the result of attendance and just specifically the PID students, their attendance grew from 57% to I believe 75%, right? So those conversations were had and the, the things in the action plan were done in partnership. Um, I was very intentional about um, requesting to our team that those PID conversations that neither the student nor the parent would walk away feeling like this is hopeless. Because if they walk out of those conversations feeling like it's hopeless, then they're gonna say, well, why bother, right? And so we made sure that um, the, 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 the benchmarks and the goals in the action plan were things that were achievable and that got harder over time. So for example, if you had a student that had 60 missed days, all right, first three weeks, can you come to school one day a week? You can do that, great. Now come to school two days a week. Great, now come to school three days a week. And so we gradually upped the ante in uh, what was in the action plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I see, I was gonna say, so that really corresponds with that improved attendance and discipline. Yes, ma'am. Those those early, inter those conversations led to- Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee, anyone else? Yes, Dr. Green. So um, thanks for all this. It was a lot to take in. And um, it seems to me that the challenge for you this year is to create systems, as you've often said to us, and to create structures that allow this, these kinds of improvements to, to occur. Um, and I applaud you know, the growth that you're, you're seeing. So I'm, what I'm looking at uh, is, is slide 75 and um, the nine investments. So can you, you can choose one or you can choose some, but I'm particularly interested in, uh, among other things, <laughs> trauma-informed supports given the context of schooling right now and the story that we've been telling about 11-year-olds and I, were, I was tutoring at measles. 
on a Friday and the, that weekend, one of the children I worked with never came back. So uh, I think that's something that we have to be really cognizant of, and we don't have to keep reminding ourselves either. This is just part of school. But I think the, the difficult part sometimes uh, is in the area of the culture, culture and adult mindsets. And as much as you know, I want to drill down and understand something about disaggregating data, I'm really curious to know um, what that means to you and uh, school ecosystems seem to be related to culture. What do you have in mind? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. Uh, you're right, systems are important. Um, you know, when you look at the most successful organizations, uh, the systems outlast the people, right? And uh, unfortunately, right now, we are a little bit too person-centric, right? Things, the things that we do, how we operate, the decision we make are centered on one person. But as I often tell the team, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, this has to continue, right? So it's not about me. So you have to focus on systems that can outlast anyone. Apple remains Apple despite Steve Jobs not being there because systems are in place and they outlive the person. So I just wanted to start there as a, as a high point. Uh, mindsets are important, right? Um, if you are in a leadership role in a school building or you are a teacher in a school building and you don't think that the kids can learn or that they want to learn, or if you don't think that our parents care, or if you think that the work is too much, too hard, as opposed to an opportunity to do something that's never been done before, then you are automatically kind of setting yourself up for success. And it all starts with mindsets. And students uh, know whether or not that uh, the adult in front of them, whether or not that adult cares for them. And research after research shows that kiddos don't learn from people who they think don't love them and care about them. And so you really can't walk into a classroom or you can't walk into a building with the mindset that these kids don't want to learn or can't learn. So it starts with mindsets. Uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about progress we've made in different areas, but we've had a, a couple of failures this year. There are a couple of times we bombed this year. We had uh, good intentions. We had a great plan, but people didn't believe in the plan. And a plan is only as good as the people executing the plan. And so if that mindset that's necessary to execute the plan is not there, the plan goes nowhere. And so I had to take a pause and say, okay, let's slow down. Let's make sure that not only do we have the right people on the bus, but they're in the right seats on the bus and assessing mindsets. And so we've been very intentional uh, about that because ultimately uh, adult culture drives everything. Uh, you can't uh, reprimand students for uh, fighting or disagreeing, but the adults in the building don't say please and thank you to each other, right? Or they don't even talk to each other when they walk by each other in the hallway. The kiddos see all of that. And so we've been super intentional about uh, addressing um, uh, mindsets. We also have other data points like the fact that in prior years, we did stipends. Uh, you know, we thought that if we paid teachers more, if we gave them additional stipends, they would come in droves and they would stay. Uh, but from last year to this year, we only retained 60% of teachers. When I saw that data point, what that told me is that it's not about money. And so we started talking to teachers, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's one thing to do exit interviews. Everyone does exit interviews. But by the time you do an exit interview and you get the data points, it's too late. We've been intentional about now doing stay interviews. So why are you deciding to stay? And we're happy to say that this year, we saw a 10% uh, percentage point increase in the number of teachers saying that they intend to return next year. It's now 78%, right? So we wanted to talk to those people. Why do you want to stay? so that we can double down on those things and build on it. And the vast majority of teachers, they don't talk about money. They don't even talk about the length of the day or anything like that. They talk about, am I getting support from my admin? Do I feel valued? Do I work in an environment that is collegial? It's all culture stuff. And so that's why we have to, to focus uh, there because it makes the difference uh, in the building. And as we all know, a happy employee is a more productive employee. So we want people to be excited to come to work. I will say 
in the fall, seeing the number of staff, um, the staff who are absent was alarming. But we decreased staff absences by 11% from quarter one to quarter three. It's not because we're giving an attendance bonus or anything like that. We've improved the culture. We've provided better support to teachers. And as you can see, um, as we showed, 81% of our teachers are now saying that they enjoy the work that they do. They feel more supported. So they're starting to come to work more. Teachers in front of kids more, more instructional time, improve academic outcomes. It's all connected. So a related point, uh, and it's something I think we need to continue, all of us always need to work on. Um, I'm re I've been reading a, a doctoral thesis um, and the writer uh, comes to the conclusion, probably rightly, that teachers have, should stop trying to change the minds of parents, that teachers themselves need to change their own mindsets. Uh, and I think, you know, part of the, the gap is that in my own work, I've seen that families have a very different view of what it means to be an engaged parent than what teachers say. Teachers, homework, reading, practicing letters, uh, parents, I just want my kid to be a good person. Uh, and that disconnect occurs because no one's talking to each other. So just as you, I think you're getting at the need for to ask teachers, what do you need? We need to be asking families. And I'm raising this, as you know, uh, from the last board meeting that 38 families responded to a survey. And our uh, numbers are a lot better, I don't think. Uh, but I think that's a national thing. Parents feel like, well, whatever decision is going to be made, it's already been made. Why should I be involved? Why should I respond? to a survey. So I guess the question is, how do you change the culture so that families actually feel like they're partners in their children's education? How do you work together? And I'm not thinking about how do you double the surveys? I mean, how do you bring, you, know, you all get that. So, you know, is how do you change the culture? Uh, that, that's a great question, Dr. Green. And I don't know that we have enough time to kind of really dive into that itself. Um, I'll start off by saying I don't have all the answers and I'm not one of those people that's afraid to say I don't know when I don't know and I'm not going to pretend that I know all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we need to recognize is that uh, for children, uh, home is the first school. It's the first classroom and the parent is the first teacher. Unfortunately, for many of our parents that we're talking about, their own schooling experience was so traumatic that they have no incentive to return to school, even as a parent. And so if schools, uh, as they have been historically, a place of trauma for black folks, brown folks, and poor folks, when you're a parent, you don't wanna go back to schools. And we can give a number of examples around that. Um, and we see it in a number of areas. I can think back to example, you know, in New York, for example, all the school buildings have a, a security officer that looks like law enforcement. And so and none of our immigrant parents wanted to come into the buildings because they felt it was immigration, right? And it took us a while to figure that out. But once we figured out the, tr the trigger that they felt by just seeing someone at the front desk who was just going to ask for their ID to sign in, what that meant for them, we had to address that. And again, our parents, uh, uh, many of them who are facing societal uh, trauma, poverty, crime, you name it, had their own traumatic experience um, when they were in school. And so they're not eager to come back to school for any reason, right? And that's not something that any one individual can solve. Um, it, it, is, uh, it requires a larger conversation, a very honest conversation, not a surface level conversation, um, and I don't know that we always engage in those types of conversations. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, Ms. Grastello, you? Yes, I want to also thank you, Dr. Lewis, and also the other panel members uh, for presenting a very informal uh, session here tonight. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm like uh, Mrs. McCullough over here. Um, you know, I, I guess it's the name Empowerment Zone. Uh, I really don't know what that is. 
and I, here I am a board member. Um, I've tried to uh, visit and go around to the schools. And to be honest with you, I, I don't see any difference in your schools than I do the other schools. Not that something is going on in the classroom that is special, and I think you pointed that out. And I, uh, I've had private shop, uh, conversations with you, and, and uh, we've discussed things, and I believe they're, they are taking place. And under your leadership, I hope we can have you around here uh, assisting us in the future in that with those schools in that area. I just have a problem with the name. I, I, you know, we are the South Bend Community School Corporation. Round here, we have a elected panel of board members who are responsible, that we are responsible uh, with the taxpayers that put us in here. We are responsible for the finances of this empowerment zone. Yet, we get indirect, if, if that, as far as what's coming out of it. Um, to be honest with you, uh, the people, some of the people inside and especially outside have negative comments about the empowerment zone. So I guess what I, I, I like to have the best of everything in the world. If we can do away with the empowerment zone name and keep you around as the leadership role, I'd love that. And that's where I'm at. And uh, because it is not anything with any of their schools. The last school that I was assigned to in the South Bend School Corporation was Navarre. It's in my heart and in my soul, that school. I do anything in the world to, to do anything to improve those test scores for those kids because I know the community and I know those kids. And so that's where I'm at. And God bless you and, and good luck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Costello. I, I'm very flattered and I'm happy to stay in South Bend as long as I'm invited to do so. Thank you. Anyone else? I just have one. Something triggered in my just yes, one question. Go ahead. Something triggered in my mind when some uh, Dr. Green was speaking, and you mentioned seventy six percent of your teachers are coming back. Seventy eight indicated 78. on the intent to return survey that they uh, okay. plan to come back. Okay, so as an educator, in my mind, and you know, as an educator, that if a teacher has not gone through the um, educational program at a university, it's kind of hard to sit in front of a student when you're trying to get their grades up and get them to, to be academically sound. So how many of the teachers in the problem zone are certified teachers? I don't have that exact number, but what I can say to you is that our non-renewals this year were primarily uh, uh, or EP teachers, uh, because we gave them prior notice in the fall that they needed to be either in a program or to meet the, the state requirements, as opposed to just keep going from year to year on an emergency permit. The ones who uh, responded appropriately, providing proof that they were in a program or working towards full certification, were invited back. The ones who were unable to provide that were non-renewed. Uh, but I can't give you an exact number, but I'll follow up. That's, an, that's important information. Yes, ma'am. Because, as I said, you're sitting at an apartment zone, transformation zone, whatever name they want to make it, and you have four schools, one school in particular that was a state, uh, supposed to have been state takeover. That was Navar. Those other four schools were just thrown in there. So you're sitting there in an apartment zone with five, five schools. And from the data that I'm looking at, the students have not improved academically. So in order to get those kids to improve academically, you have to have certified teachers sitting in front of them. You have to. They will not progress otherwise. You can have adjusted people coming from and have maybe um, a degree in business or a degree in whatever, but if they're not trained at a university in an educational program, they do not know how or have the resources to teach those children. 
And so you're in a turnaround effort that is not going to progress, move those kids forward without that information. So I just wanted to say that to the public that's listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I just want to say thank you. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you have a difficult job. Um, you have been very diplomatic this evening, um, I, and I will be less di diplomatic in that. The first three years of the zone, I never saw a financial statement. Um, it, there were a lot of things that were very distressing. So you've been left with a, a cleaning up, a turnaround that three, now four years in, it really hasn't been a turnaround. Now, the question in front of us is, you know, what happens, obviously, next year is coming, and how does that address, obviously, and you you handle that very well. You've got two boards that have discussions that they have to have. And and what I appreciate is that you know, your leadership is, uh, you've been much more collegial, collaborative. Uh, you understand these are South Bend schools. You were handed a project that the state jammed on South Bend schools uh, because they wanted to punish us for, we'll, we'll get into all those details later about Navarre. And, um, you know, that I was on the website today looking at the financials that you provide the board every month. Uh, you know, all of these things are progress. The question is, you've only been there for what, eight months or probably seems like 10 years. Feels like eight years. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the school board time is different than regular time. Um, but so, so the question in front, and this isn't to you, this is just a comment in general that we've heard comments from our board members, comments from the public, comments from the other board, you know, how, how does this move forward? Does it end? Does it extend in some different fashion? And those are conversations that lots of people will be having over the next uh, few weeks, months. Uh, I looked at your timeline. I kind of laughed when you had the dates of the votes. Like, eh, it's the school board stuff that so might not end up being then, but we'll see. But I want to thank you for what you're doing, what you're trying to do, what the whole point of this is to have innovation, to have progress. What's frustrating is we're here and we kind of don't have it, but it doesn't mean we can't create the opportunity to still have it. So that's where we stand and that's where we will discuss and that's we'll find out how we all move forward soon enough. So again, thank you very much for your presentation this evening and for 90 slides, you did a really nice job. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Board President Anella. Uh, thank, I appreciate the feedback. I will say uh, when I took the role, I wasn't expecting to be working this hard um, uh, based on what I kind of thought coming in. Um, uh, my Popeye's expenditure has increased significantly. <laughs> uh, fried chicken is my stress food. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's been an interesting time and I'm happy to continue um, to do the best that I can for the time that I'm provided to do so. So thank you, board members. It was a pleasure. Uh, Ms. McCullough, I'll absolutely follow up with you on that additional detail. Um, and any other board member that has follow-up, I will happily make myself available. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. And keep checking your blood pressure and your blood cell. Okay, that concludes our academic focus this evening. Uh, we did not have anyone signed up for hearing of visitors on action agenda items. So that brings us to hearing of visitors on other items. And at regular meetings, the public is invited to address the board for three minutes regarding items not posted on the agenda. Individuals may only speak once during this section of the agenda. Speakers shall properly identify themselves after they approach the podium by stating their name and address for the record. Personnel issues are not to be addressed during open sessions of the school board. The board president may interrupt, warn, or terminate a person's statement if the statement becomes personally directed abusive or obscene. Ms. Hernandez will take care of the timer, and I see Mr. Brown at the podium, so the floor is yours. Okay, uh, my name is Samuel Brown. I live in 222 East McBride Street in the city of South Bend. Uh, the young man that got killed on Johnson Street, uh, my daughter uh, told me to tell Dr. Cummins he did an excellent job of giving them all the resources they needed over there to help the teachers with the kids. She was very happy that she teaches at Navarro. Uh, what I want to say is, John Adams, I really owe a indebted to John Adams High School. My granddaughter, Indonesia Brown, uh, went to John Adams. She graduated. But I 
went to the University of Notre Dame for four years. She was on the dean's list. And she was on the football team as a manager. Also, Indy uh, got accepted into Notre Dame's law school. I was very, very proud of her. If some of the things that's happening in our schools, they can be corrected. And these, I'm very, very proud of her. She applied to seven law schools and she was accepted at all of them. UCLA flew out for the weekend out in uh, Los Angeles. She really liked Los Angeles. But the thing Indy didn't tell us was her heart was no day. When she got the letter, which was accepted in Notre Dame Law School, uh, I, I just broke down and cried. <laughs> but I think she'll do a good job. I really do. And all my schools, we got Raleigh, Washington. I come to the board meetings, I listen to them. We, got, we just got to just keep them on the right path. We got beautiful kids in these schools, and we can't let them down. So I just want to just tell you, it's a hard job, but I think we got the right people in the right places. We just got to keep working together. 30 seconds. Can't, can't let these kids down. Thank each and every one of y'all that sits on this board. It's a hard job. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Komanich Wheeler. I stay at 1628 South Carlisle Street, and I am here standing for my community today, South Bend, Indiana, as always. And um, I have a grandson. His name is Elijah Wheeler, and he goes to Madison. And he just took a test, bicep test. The average was the past was 4, 450, and my grandson scored a 625. And today, uh, my daughter, we get a drawing from him from the schools, and I'm a grand. My kids are grown and out of school, thank God. And but when the young people can't stand in a community, as these young mothers, two thousand mothers who have kids that are that are about eight, I stand on the inner city. I'm a mother who works with these young mothers who kids are probably clowning and everything. So. Uh, Wednesday, I get a knock on the door from the auntie of the 11 year old boy. Um, I always try to be a voice for the inner city. I get overlooked a lot, but here I am. I'm still fighting to be a voice um, that stands with our school corporation in agreement. I totally agree with uh, Miss McCullough, who probably don't remember me, but I remember her. And um, the division, the empowerment zone has caused corruption to our community. So I'm standing as a citizen as well as grandmother. And the reason why I say corruption, because I was at the meetings when you try to take police out of school and this and this and that. And I also stand with the doctor here on togetherness and, and bringing it all back under to one accord. I think that is a great idea. Um, dealing with the family, some families that weren't in the empowerment zone at first and then eventually went over. They had a st stable, stable background here with the school board. And then once we got some kids got over there, they were told different things. So it brought a lot of confusion to the community. Well, my son had this many grades and now he's going over here. Now his grades are like this. So I'm kind of just sitting back watching and see how this development come, whether it be taken away and it put back together as a whole. That's very interesting to me. But going back to 11 year old and with my grandson being high honor roll student and his drawing he drew today was of the little boy. He only played with him outside three times. 30 they, seconds. They played together outside. But the things that my grandson put on the paper and I can show you guys after because I know Dr. Todd anyways. And um, it's, it's just the trauma that is bringing into the schools is what affect in all schools, no matter what board or who running what, it's just what's going on in our city. So I'll close with saying, 
either we gonna stand together or we gonna keep allowing corruption to destroy the city. How many gonna stand? Because we tired of the corruption. We tired of seeing it. I want some togetherness for our children and for our leaders. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, President Anella, board members, and Dr. Cummings. <clears throat> I lost one of my dearest friends many years ago. I was a bridesmaid in her wedding right after college graduation. After their marriage, her husband entered medical school and became an MD. They had been high school sweethearts. Countless hours were spent with him studying, completing his residency, and then practicing medicine. My friend died due to, con due to a congenital heart defect from a birth defect that the best medical teams could not cure. Why am I telling the story? Because at her funeral, her wonderful husband stated the most valuable lesson his wife had taught him was that, that there is never enough time, a lesson he learned too late. The time for them to spend was gone. My friends also had two young children. Teachers go above and beyond every day. Great teachers do not need forced chair time to get their professional jobs done. They need time not to be robbed of time, time to collaborate and talk with their colleagues on their own time, time to organize classrooms, units of study, to plan, to do record keeping, make material preparation, time to meet with students before and after school, Time to lead school-sponsored clubs before and after school. Time to voluntarily participate in school activities, fundraisers, PTOs, and the community. I've always said that when data teaches the student, I want to know about it. The real miracles take place in classrooms with teachers teaching and positive interactions with all school staff. We pay people to crunch plenty of data. Data does not teach children. Does anyone understand that by demanding and taking 80 additional minutes per week from teachers, that teachers are less inclined to volunteer or to be present on other occasions? Does anyone understand that for some of our teachers, the forced 80 minutes means 80 minutes a week for the teacher's own children to be an additional 80 minutes a week of daycare or babysitting? Teachers have raised very valid issues about this forced 80 minutes on many occasions. It is time for the time robbing, stress-inducing, disrespectful 80 minutes to stop. It is time to listen to teachers who have colleagues who have left the district and moved on to other districts nearby because they refuse to deal with the nonsense. In this day and age, no one needs 80 minutes a week for staff meetings and made up busy work and time not used effectively. Um, there are many other ways that are acceptable by the IDOE to address the professional development needs. We are respectfully asking for the forced, non-productive 80 minutes a week to be stopped. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Emily Byer, 2735 Tomahawk Trail, South Bend, Indiana. I'm a parent, a teacher, and a voter. I want to remind everyone that our students are more than a test score. I just want to start off with that. As I sat and watched the last board meeting from a hospital bed, I wondered why many things, I wondered many things. I wondered why students are leaving South Bend schools. I wondered why shared rights and responsibilities that is in South Bend schools ties the hands of the teachers and the principals. As a kindergarten teacher, I have been kicked, hit, bitten, punched, taken down to the ground by a student this year. I had a lumbar spinal epidural injection because of being hurt at school. I have seen students run out of rooms and it's a game to them. They get all the attention from multiple adults. I have heard from colleagues worry about their safety in the school while teaching. Safety is one of those Maslow hi hierarchy of needs, right? As I am thankful for you for voting in an alternative K-8 school and the plan for the, not this year, but the following year, I'm saddened as to why it had to come about. It doesn't help teachers and students going forward this year and for next year. I wonder what the requirements are also for students to attend that location. We need an option for our, our most struggling learners for whom it is there where they are tier four. They are in it. We, need, we needed the months 
we needed that months ago. Sorry, I'm nervous. I wondered if this is why we are losing students because parents who are appalled by the behavior their students are being exposed to at school are leaving if they can. I wonder if they feel that the support is not for, there for their students, but for other students. They know that teachers and principals are doing all that they can, but it's not enough. We are talking about a pervasive disrespect and verbal and physical aggression, hitting, kicking, biting, throwing chairs, tipping desks, books, yelling, screaming, cussing, etc. Though we as teachers have empathy for these students and are often understood and often understand their traumas, I'm not sure that they're, they are appropriately placed in a full day academic setting in our schools. I wonder where the district is at and planning for an alternative school option for next year. Many of these students might benefit from a therapeutic setting or an alternative placement, and we currently don't have a model for that. I also wonder if students are leaving because of transportation issues, bus students not coming or coming super late. As a parent, my own children ride the bus because they want to. But this morning I had to take them with me to school because they attend my school. And I was not told that the bus was going to be late. 30 seconds. I have two students not uh, attend school on Friday or today because their bus never showed. And unfortunately that family relies on busing to get to school and get home. I also wonder why as teachers, we have an extra 80 minutes of unpaid time every week. I wonder why our union president and other members have come and told you about this. And it appears nothing has done. Is it because it's the same faces? Well, here's my face and here's my voice. And I'm telling you, there are better ways to meet the collabor need of collaborating with teachers inside our current teacher work day. Three minutes meetings, are up. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Amy Asmus, and I'm gonna continue her speech. These meetings are not equitable in all schools. Some teachers have to act out things, some have to sing songs, some are looking at data, and some schools, their meetings are canceled. This doesn't make sense. We have attempted for the last two years to come to a compromise. Some of the things we have suggested, once a month, a half day early release with the afternoon being asynchronous, which is allowed by the IDOE. One hour early releases, one hour late starts, which the zone is implementing the releases. Going from 80 minutes twice a week to 40 minutes once a week, having a staff meeting once a month and many others. The empowerment zone could figure out early dismissals on Thursdays, so I think we can too. Your teachers don't feel valued. We don't feel heard. We feel that these meetings are pointless. Remember, a person who feels appreciated will always do more than what is expected. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jane Matz, um, 67995 Lake Trail. And I'd like to say, hello, I'm back. Um, I retired. I taught at South Bend for 30 years and I came back for the board meeting tonight. I really didn't plan on speaking, but here I am and just wanted to tell the truth. And so uh, it has to do with that 80 minutes of time that teachers are giving every week and they feel so disrespected about it. Um, and I just am giving it one more go. I tried last year to try and convince some people to stop that practice and it didn't stop. So I'm back again this year and I'm very happy I'm retired and I don't have to do the 80 minutes of a professional development. So I'm very excited about it. Um, but the main thing is, a happy, enthusiastic, motivated teacher is more important than any amount of professional development. Happy, motivated, enthusiastic teacher will have those types of students and their test scores will raise or rise. I guess I'm not, I wasn't an English teacher. <laughs> um, so anyways, I just hope that you change your mind and go for the happy teachers and not go for the 80 minutes of time where teachers felt disrespected. And to tell you the truth, it did play into my decision to retire a year early. So it wasn't the whole decision, but it was part of it. And I think that there's a lot of teachers that if you wanted to do the research, you could just send a letter to everyone who retired last year and everyone who retired this year and ask them 
how much that played into their decision to either leave the profession, go to a different school, or retire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Adrienne Cowyer. I reside at 3103 Hilltop Drive, South Bend. On Saturday, I um, attended the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame in Indianapolis. My colleague, best friend, Charmonique Starworth, was honored um, as an Indiana Hall of Fame recipient. But um, in this uh, program, to my dismay, I opened it up and the incorrect information was here, which was um, an ad by the South Bend Community School Corporation. Um, it reads Charmonique Starworth 2023 Silver Anniversary Team. She was a Hall of Fame inductee, and she was a 2017 Silver Team Anniversary member uh, recipient. Um, I, I guess it was embarrassing um, coming from South Bend and, and, and a, a lot of us from all over the state to come um, uh, represent um, 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 for her support. And um, I just wanted to know who wrote this, who wrote this ad and who's responsible for this. And do you fact check? Did you check with her to see if um, the facts listed were correct? Because if you know better, you do better. Thank you. Thank you. Short. Oops. Um, Beverly Beck, um, 1630 East Randolph Street. Oop. Anyway, can you hear me? Um, I don't like complaining about my school corporation because I love this corporation. It's been good to me, all my kids, my grandkids, everybody. But the 80 minutes bothers me too. I sit there and watch some of those teachers. They have so much work to do back in their room. They're thinking about what they should be planning for the next day. They got to take a bunch of papers home to grade. After 60 some years, I don't have to grade papers now. Mine's a data driven thing, I'm a reading specialist now. And I find it very rewarding. But they tell us that the board is the one that wants the 80 minutes. You know, we could do it with a release time or something like that and probably enjoy it. But they said the board is the one that wants this. And I don't, it can't be the new board because it's going on, going on a couple of years now. But uh, anyway, you need to know it. It's not, it's resented. It's, uh, it, I don't have so much work to do in my room after school as what some of those teachers do. I feel so sorry for them because they have so much that they have to plan for the next day. And they sit there and do things like sing songs, eat cheese crackers, all kinds of things like that. Uh, plan things that, and our principal is a good one. She tries to plan things for us. She even lets us out of it once in a while. But um, I just think that it's wasted time. We'd be better off to do it some afternoon as we lose time when we could do something and probably enjoy doing it together. So uh, whoever's behind it, please think it over, would you? Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I come after someone who is my height. I still fix it. I am Jessica Hoover. Uh, dear members of the board, I'm here tonight on behalf of many of your South Bend teachers regarding the 80 minutes of the PLC time outside of our contractual hours. Two years ago, you were made aware of the concerns regarding this time being mandated outside of our time. We are still out here pleading with this board to work with us to fix this issue that is draining teachers and killing our morale. Not that long ago, we helped pass a referendum promising significant salary increases to teachers. Teachers then had to turn around and fight hard for the raise we did receive, only for it to be eaten up with the added 80 minutes each week behind our, beyond our contractual time once again, making that raise null. And the 80 minutes we have to stay became a mandate on our own free time. Free time. We have asked for the last two years to please fix this and allow the PLC time to be done during once a month half day release time. You've heard this earlier. The IDOE does allow this. They allow the students to come in to school for half a day and the other half could be asynchronous e-learning. During this time, teachers and staff would have their PLC time as well um, a lot of time for breakout sessions with grade level teams um, to plan some building administration announcements or for any other required professional development sessions. This is just one of our suggested compromises. Many districts do this across the state and the zone does an early release once a week. We're asking for once a month. 
It seems that all that happens is to take more and more away from us. It is time to give this time back to your hardworking teachers. Please work with us on this matter. I heard earlier the zone said, nothing replaces a teacher. They believe in wellness, longevity, and retention. We need you guys to feel this about us. We need you to work together with this. We have done it for two years. We have not seen significant um, improvements with anything except for teachers leaving and being drained. Um, I also I was interested about the MOU um, with the zone. It gave away five of our schools to, other, to others to control with no real measurable ben benchmarks or plan to bring these schools back. Interesting because teacher goals, they have to be SMART goals that are measurable and have an end in sight. This was definitely not a SMART goal, it appears. We need to bring these schools back as one solid corporation, not by sending money to duplicate positions and systems. It was said that it's meant to be as a partnership versus a competition. Why? We already have plenty of capable South Bend administrators that can oversee schools, especially now that more are closing, there's less of them to run. We need to bring them back to our district and work together as one. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Fox. I live at 18247 Westover Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46637. Throughout the last month, many community members asked for two-way communication. Instead, we had listening sessions. I would like to respond to some of the recent comments. First, I would like to say on the advisement of Ms. Wesley on 320, as a family, you can make a decision. If your salary is 190,000, you can take a voucher and take your child. I have discovered I do qualify for a voucher and I do have options. I would also like to speak to another comment at that same meeting where she stated, if you don't have the money in your household to make changes or renovations, how would you expect for a school district to make those same changes when there's no money? My answer to that is I would not renovate one of my children's rooms using all of my budget and leave a leaky roof in others. They would both get minimal renovations to fit my budget, and I would cut cable and cell phones and luxury items to make sure all rooms in my home were safe and adequate. This corporation has been neglecting children at Clay while making renovations to all other high schools, as well as overspending on outsourcing and administration instead of cutting those costs. I would now like to look at Mrs. Ball's statements on 417. You stated the people coming into Clay Building starting fights for the CTE. That was true on one occasion, but on the other, a girl took an Uber to start that fight at our school. It was, in fact, malicious. You also stated that our neighborhoods are segregated. You spoke about how your neighborhood has changed. I invite you to come to Arlington Heights subdivision. I assure you it's changed over the last 20 years and we're really quite diverse. You said people talking about they love South Bend schools, but you're gonna leave. You don't love South Bend schools. You love your own choice. My choice was part of South Bend schools and it was perfect for my family, but you have cast aside what was best for my children. So yes, I must go elsewhere. And Karima Fowler told the Tribune, she was okay with losing some kids if it gets you where you wanna go. So now I know my family is just collateral damage. Mrs. Lee said on 417 that college is now a high school, high school is a middle school, and kindergartners today are learning what people in my generation didn't know until at least second grade. Not in our house. My kids will remain kids as long as possible. They don't have social media. They aren't allowed to work until after high school, and we aren't in a hurry for them to drive. They are kids. Also, my second grade niece has been in your corporation since kindergarten. She's still reading at a kindergarten level, according to Sylvan. So maybe it's time to slow down because children are being left behind. And Ms. Ranella, on 417, you said, we need to ensure every affected person comes out in as good or better position than 30 before. 30 seconds. No matter what I choose, I have to replace an entire wardrobe of spirit wear, a letter jacket, a custom purple and gold DeMarini bat, and those are the simple things. My son has to build new relationships with every coach, teacher, and counselor, and maybe he's no longer number one in the class of 2025 his senior year. How will it ever be better for our family? Or did every person not include us? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Melody Glupski, 24375 Baroque Drive. Um, I told my husband I wasn't going to talk tonight, but I'm having a real hard time holding my tongue. Um, you've heard lots of different things about this extra 80 minutes. There are plenty of ways that we could accomplish the th same things that would, again, make teachers happier. Happy teachers, happy students, learning happens. Well, I, I want to give you a little bit 
a little bit different information also. Since it is, we were forced this unpaid. That's 68 days that we've had to come in early. That's 2,720 minutes of, my, of our time that has been wasted. And I'm gonna say wasted because there's very little happening in these uh, early morning sessions. That's 45 hours for the whole year. That's almost $3,000 out of my pocket that I'm not making because I'm being unpaid and forced to come. Now on the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays when we don't have to come in early, I'm still at school early because I want the children to be able to come into my area and use my space during that time that they cannot use on Tuesday and Thursday. It's unfair for the teachers to have to work unpaid. It's unfair for the students that are not getting their teacher's time on those days, that those students truly and truly need their teacher's time. I walk in that building early on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and most of the rooms have teachers in them. We are there doing things, but it's on our time that we're willing to give for our students. But the 80 minutes where we're sitting and, and not do, accomplishing much, and when somebody else had mentioned um, in one of our meetings with the administration, because I'm on the union um, negotiating team, we've met, and that um, it was mentioned that the team building is important. Well, it's been a number of years ago, but a team building one time in one of my buildings, the, the principal had us two slips of paper and on that slip of paper was a household appliance. And what we had to do in front of the staff was act out the household appliance. Well, quite frankly, mine was a toilet. I'm a professional and I refuse to act like a toilet in front of my colleagues. This is the type of professional development seconds. we often get. It's ridiculous and it is total and complete waste of our time. Thank you. Thank you. Jump Chesney 18420 Crown Hill Drive in South Bend. After the zone presentation, damn, they could show this corporation and administration and board more than a few things and ideas. Last week, I received my property tax bill. Like most, I was prayed, prepared for the sticker shock. But what really got me was 50% of my taxes or more go to this corporation that never seems to discuss the lack of academic achievement or the severe deficiencies in learning. Does anyone know what the proficiency is of our graduating classes in high school at 75%? Last year, only 17.6% of the eighth graders going into high school were proficient. Again, I say, when will academic programs be the focus and not vouchers and the build down state? Brown, Jefferson, LaSalle, Kennedy, Marquette, Nooner, Harrison, Mesa, Lincoln, all have been renovated or rebuilt under former boards. All the while, Schools like Green, Clay, Hamilton, Tarkington, Eggleston, Clay High, Burley, and Warren, nine buildings that are either closed or will be closed, have been neglected. Is your plan to end up with an inner city school corporation? If so, then why should the, the townships continue to remain part of this corporation? Wait, the answer is easy. We are not going to keep buildings open in your area or township but we are going to take your tax money and bring it into the inner city. If enrollment continues to fall, and it will continue to fall, it is going to continue the domino effect of shuttering buildings. You only have three left in the, in the township, Darden, Clay, IA, and Swanson. So which one of those are next on the chopping block? I am still waiting to hear how this massive reorganization plan is going to improve academics. Looking at it, I keep thinking what chaos it's going to bring to parents who don't read it or parents who don't understand it and how many kids are affected by changing schools. By the time all these changes are implemented, and if they all are implemented, I suspect we'll be back here talking about right sizing and money. And broken and the broken seconds. record continues to play over and over, but maybe next time the players will change by then. 
Thank you. Paul and asked this 51680 Orange Road, South Bend. Using my First Amendment right, what I say should not be held against me, my family, or my coworkers. So you've now accepted one of the facility plans, which is to address now and future declining enrollment. Some might say thanks for the hard effort and looking out for the community and students. But upon further examination, you have not helped anyone. If you break this down, it was said that this is a working document. This plan, in order to reach the end result, would take 20 to 30 years to achieve and the full price tag is $260 million. I hope I am speaking for the majority when I say thanks, but no thanks. First, you have wasted resources to try and plan any further than a couple of years. Then there is the level off period of continued shrinking enrollment due to this plan. And let's not forget, history has a way of repeating itself. So I feel we will be back here at the table before the five years, which is the remainder of the referendum and then let's not forget the price tag. You only have about $30 million of referendum that you can invest in this. So you will leave us with a plan that will never completely happen and a $230 million list of unachievable projects. So why are you not being cautious with spending? When I look at the bill pays every agenda, I find a list of payments that I myself as a taxpayer would question. Payments for tickets to ballparks, some events at a local theater, which is portion, which a portion was paid out of an account maintenance of building cleaning services. How, if you outsource these services, do you still hold a budget for it? There's a $25,000 uh, bill for a community partnership pay payable to an individual, not a company, payment to a local grocery on two different lines, same check number, same description, same total, but different accounts. So the board should demand answers. Remember, when you approve these bill pays, it's saying you have reviewed and approved what is being paid. And as if I, and as if we don't have enough staff administration, there is a payment to a company under description temp service budget Fowler, and the account it came from was administrative staffing services. You also paid for some kind of rental space, and the description was facility plan paid out of ESSER account. Why, when you have all these buildings under your control, would you have to rent a space? Um, and you say what you do is for the children. So since you think you can party like a rock star, 30 seconds. Please, and I repeat, please don't ask us for another referendum. Thank you. I am very, very nervous. First time I ever talked. Good evening, school board members. My name is Andrea Lane. I am a representative for our bus drivers union. I'm speaking today on the on the behalf of our bus drivers. We have been in negotiations for roughly 10 months with no agreement. I believe we had a fair agreement. All of a sudden we came back and now they want to take our field trip pay. I get paid, I've been there for 17 years. I get paid twenty dollars an hour. Now they want to take my field trip pay and my activity pay and drop it down eighteen dollars and fifty cents. To me, I've been working since I was been fifteen years old. Not only have I got raises, nobody's ever taken them away from me. Not that I don't. I don't quite understand that. Bus drivers are a vital part of the South Bend Community School Corporation. We put a lot of. We put. We put up with a lot. We have shootings on the bus. We've had knives on the bus. My best friend had been punched in the face, not once, but twice. We have, our even our supervisors have been threatened when they come out to try to help us. You know, it just pains me that you guys, oh God, I gotta I got calm down here for a second. I'm so sorry. We have, Every day that I walk through the bus, walk to my bus, I feel like I am a target in a circus, a shooting target at a circus. I have nowhere to go. I'm in a 10,000 square box. 
I don't have a basement to go to. I don't have a classroom to go to. Where am I going to take 44 children if somebody's shooting a gun at us? I have nowhere to go. But now you want to take my money away from me and not give us a raise. I don't understand that. We came to a conclusion. It was a wonderful conclusion. And now all of a sudden they came back and said something else. I'm not understanding it. The enrollment drops. Sorry, again, I'm very nervous. I understand that we are tight on money, but enrollment drops. Not only when the enrollment, enrollment drops in the schools, but we add 10, 10 positions at an average salary of $50,000. In conclusion, 30 seconds. I would, we deserve our raise and we deserve our retro pay. Thank you so much for listening to me. Sorry, I was nervous. Thank you. Good evening, school board. This will be the first time I ever spoke in front of you guys. And I also am a bus driver. And we as a community that work for the South Bend Community School Corporation, from the teachers, the bus drivers, there's a lot of feeling of disrespect that we are not being valued for the work that we do. We come to work. We're doing the best that we can. And you say Team South Bend, but we constantly feel like we're being the ones tossed to the side, the players that don't matter. But you say we all matter. And all we're asking for from the teachers, the bus drivers, the principal, all staff, show us respect, the same respect that you want from us. And we show that respect. We get up four o'clock in the morning to be on a bus to pick up kids. Teachers, I mean, I am surprised you guys want 80 minutes. Is this a week? Do you go anywhere and just give up your time? But you, they say we're willing to do that if we're shown respect and shown that we are appreciated. There's a many a times I can get done at 6.15, 6.20. I don't ask for that 15 minutes. I don't. But when you start taking money from us, only thing we can do is say, it's not acceptable. And then I'm hearing, ooh, we're hiring more people, but you say we don't have the money. The students are leaving, but we're doing our job. We're doing the best that we can, and we cannot continue to cover the team. The team cannot continue to be carried on the teacher's back, the bus driver's back. Let's be a team. Every, every, if I got to take a pay cut, everybody needs to take a pay cut. 30 seconds. You know, if, if we, if we got to tighten the belt, everybody tighten your belt. Everybody, because it's a team. But when you feel like you're the only ones being singled out, it's not fair. And all we're asking for is respect. That's what we're asking the school board for. And it hurts to tell people that grew up in South Bend, they're closing clay. People are like, what? Three minutes are up. Thank Sorry. You. Anybody else? Thank you. <laughs> oh, in case you didn't know, I'm Deb Ward's daughter. And thank you. This hurts. It hurts. Does anyone else wish to speak at this time? Hello, my name is Kina Jirogi, and I live at 608 South Kentucky Street. I really didn't want to come up here and speak because I've come to several of these meetings speaking, 
And it's like, whatever I say falls on deaf ears. It's like whoever I'm standing in front of is so important that they can't listen to me. And my issue is transportation. You all say that you want attendance to go up. My issue is I stay in a spot where I've talked to several of your board members with one telling me, oh, you need to find a daycare, put her in boys or girls club, just get over it. Well, I'm sorry, I can't get over it. When my daughter and other kids in her same situation are on the same page in the same situation, that doesn't sit well with me. I went to a HBCU. My kids did not. I have a 25-year-old that went through this school system and now has a master's degree. So I know it can be done, but not under these circumstances. The circumstances have changed. Don't know how, but you need to take a look at that. And the fact that I'm talking to supposed to be professional people and they come at you like they're someone on the street still doesn't sit well with me. And I'm not going to call any names because they know who they are. It's just not right. And I'm being told, oh, you should have your daughter walk five blocks back in a neighborhood that you just said there's fights, shootings. There's all kinds of things going on. I go to work and you want me to sit at work and be productive, take care of my daughter, not be homeless and think she's okay on the street walking five blocks by herself and I show my concern and you just push me off to the side. No, absolutely not. And it's either she walks five blocks back or 14 blocks to the school. That doesn't make any common sense. And the bus comes down the street and can stop for five seconds and pick her up. But you want attendance to go up. How do you want attendance to go up when I've been fighting this since February to get her on a bus? Something needs to change. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Everybody knows my name and address by now. Becky Wagner, 815 West Douglas Road, Lot 148, Mishawaki, Indiana. And I'm sitting here and I listen to the empowerment zone and I'm confused. Because the way you make it sound is like they're separate, but we're the same. And we have to be the same because you're going to close Warren. And yet when you look at the chart, Warren has the most numbers that went up, the percentages. What sense does that make? I mean, where does common sense come in, people? I don't get this. Clay High School is a great high school, great teachers, great family atmosphere, but you're taking it away and you're going to lose a majority of those kids and you don't care. You do not care. And I, it makes me sick to feel that way. Kids are asking, Mamu, what about if I if I go to a different school and I'm I'm gonna, gonna be a junior, will I get to play sports varsity sports? Because you can't if you change schools, you can't play. Did you what are you gonna tell them? Do you have any answers? Where are the answers? Where's this transformation you people have? Do you have any kind of plan that you're going to give these kids before the end of the school year so they know what to do with their lives? That's all we're asking. Give us a plan because you'd sure have a plan to close the school. Now give us a plan to get these kids on forward with their lives, please. And rethink what you did, if you can do that, please, because what you've done is wrong and it's shame on you. Thank you. My name is Nicole Elson, and I just wanted to make sure that this is perfectly clear so our teacher voices aren't twisted. Teachers are not complaining about taking PD. I know how the narratives are twisted to make it look like we don't care about our kids or collaboration. Teachers are lifelong learners and continue PD often on our own. The 80 minutes currently being given to us is used for useless icebreakers. My coworkers are like family, and I am not just saying that. You cannot walk down the hallway in my building without seeing that. We don't need useless icebreakers. We know each other. We also know how to collaborate with each other. We, 
<clears throat> the options that we have been uh, that we have offered have given more time for productive PDs and collaboration. Why do you keep beating the same drum if it is broken? If you want to help the kids, then let's collaborate or plan together. Collaboration is working together. The teachers have had little to no say on anything. Pretty sad considering without us, that referendum would not have passed. Thank you. Okay, that brings to end our hearing of visitors on other items. So that brings us to our consent agenda this evening. Uh, items 8.01 through 8.07. It is recommended that the Board of School Trustees approve the consent agenda, which includes approval of minutes under item 8.01, accepting any attached financial reports and statement under item 8.02, approving any attached consolidated registers of claims and distributions of payroll for payment under item 8.03, approving personnel decisions listed on any attached reports under item 8.04, adopting any attached resolutions under item 8.05, which are required to be adopted annually, accepting any gifts to the corporation, approving any fundraisers described in any attached reports under item 8.06, and approving or ratifying any contracts for $50,000 or less listed under item 8.07. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Wesley, seconded by Dr. Green. I'll ask Mr. Hernandez to do the roll, please. Ms. Ball? Aye. Dr. Green? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. McCullough? Aye. Mr. Costello? No. Ms. Wesley? Aye. Ms. Ranella? Aye. Okay, the consent agenda has been approved. That brings us to our action items, uh, 9.01. It is recommended the board approve the contract with Right at School LLC to implement after school programming at the following schools McKinley, Marquette, LaSalle, Jefferson, Clay International, and Kennedy. This partnership in combination of existing and new community partnerships will allow the district to have after school programming at all buildings for the 2023 24 school year. The cost of this contract is $127,000 per location and is a one year contract. Do we have a motion to approve? No. Second. Moved by Dr. Green, seconded by Ms. Wesley. Uh, Dr. White, you're at the table, so tell us yes. about this contract in front of us, please. Sure. So as we continue to look at using um, CARES and ESSER dollars, one of our commitments has been to continue to not only expand extended learning opportunities, but also ensure that our students have as many opportunities to access quality programming after school. And so in combination with our current partners, this would be another solution added to those menus that our schools can select from. And so our hope and our um, the directive or um, guidance that we've given schools is that this way we can evaluate and look at those students that are in academic need, can participate in extended learning, credit recovery programs, um, those things. There are students who are participating in enrichment after school programs. And then there's students who just don't or may not have an opportunity or a placement um, for an after school safe environment. And so this is um, an opportunity for us to look at um, a program that we could possibly expand. But it gives us, again, those ESSER dollars gives us the opportunity to look at um, providing a variety of programming for our students um, through numerous partners. Um, this would allow for 45 um, spaces. We know we have lots more students than that. So again, this is not fulfilling the need at all of those buildings, but this is more of a layered um, supportive programming to give um, our schools multiple options for their students. And you said this is uh, ESSER dollars? This is, yes. And then what we, um, as we know, um, ESSER funding does um, run out at, or I shouldn't say run out, we have to spend it or exhaust those funds by 2020. Um, Four, right at schools does offer a number of models that we can look at, such as partially funding through Title I. Um, we also uh, we can offer sliding scales and scholarships for our families that are in need, but who would still like to. So um, it also offers us a host of uh, um, ways to keep this sustainable, but within this year one, um, to allow families to be able to experience it, get to know the program, but also for us to continue to work with them. We've had numerous conversations for about a year now with this um, group to really understand what their programming entails. Um, it would allow us to offer this for this year as a free option for families like, like all of our, our other current programming except for Kaleidoscope, um, but then we could also look at ways to sustain this over time. 
Thank you. Any yes. questions, comments? I do. I have yes, Ms. Pella. Can you tell me, do you know how many ESSER dollars you're talking about? Because I don't see that on here. Sure. So it's $127,000 per, per site. Um, I did not give a title, um, a total cost just because the way the contract was, I wanted to keep that language, but it would be 127,000 times those, those six locations. Okay. So as we know, in case the audience didn't know what the listening public didn't know, Esther's dollars uh, was, was given to in March the 27th, 2020. And um, it was given as an allotment to the education stabilization fund uh, during the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. So what I would like to see is those dollars that you're speaking of, this $127,000 each site that you're talking about, go directly into our schools to help the teachers in those classrooms. I think that would be a better fit than spending for after school programs. We have enough of those. And um, I think it would benefit our teachers. We also have resources that uh, we need in our schools. You hear parents talking about people coming up to the microphone talking about bus drivers talking about the uh, students and when they get on the buses and the things that's happening on the buses. And these are the kinds of these dollars would benefit these these uh, programs, these teachers and these bus drivers. Um, if you, uh, I've also asked many a time uh, for additional counselors, especially in elementary school. And we say we don't have the funds for that, but we can come up with funds, Esther dollars to give an after school program or whatever you, you, you have in this, this LLC contract. So that $127,000 would benefit a, a school counselor in an elementary school. As I said before, counselors are mental health experts and they can work with those kids in those elementary schools to help those teachers and those those uh, uh, administrators in those schools. So no, I don't think that this is a good fit for, for using those extra dollars. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? I just- Yes, Ms. Ball. Oh, sorry. Ms. You, you go well, this is just the, actually just a piggyback on um, Mrs. McCullough's comment. Actually, could someone just speak to us real briefly about the, the, the eligible uses for Esther? Because I know there are a variety of them and I just, I can't, I'm gonna be honest, I don't remember all of the um, applications for Esther. Sure, so um, Esther is a broad scope. I could yeah. provide greater um, detail, but um, unlike our other um, federal funds, such as Title I, Title II, Title IV, Title III, all of those funding sources, they all have very kind of specific rules. Um, when we look at the various, we've gotten three allotments um, of CARES extra dollars over the years since the beginning of the pandemic, again, that need to be um, spent or exhausted by 2024. The range, um, it can be from one, our priority has been to really make sure that we're accelerating and responding to students' needs after the pandemic for learning. So that's where a large proportion of our ESSER funding has gone. Um, it, it has allowed us to expand summer programming, summer learning, but then ESSER dollars can also be used for um, building improvements such as HVAC um, and things of that nature. And so when the state gave um, these sums to public schools across the different across the country, um, it is a very broad scope, um, but I'm sure we could provide kind of all of those um, approved um, offerings. One of the things that they are very clear on is that um, that funding cannot be used for things that are gonna have long-term expenditures. Um, and so that's why every time we bring something to the board that we're using ESSER funding for, um, we've created some type of sustainability plan or um, plan for it to ex expire in 2024. Okay. I'm. Um... Yeah, I'm just kind of real quick looking at something that talks about SR3. And yeah, there's a variety of uses for it. I, and if, if you could just chime in, just let me know if I'm hitting the marks because it talks about, I'm just looking at SR3 because I think sure. it's SR3. Yep. And this is just. And that was the largest, largest. Yeah. Because um, when we got it, it was in the midst of pandemic. So one of the activities is reducing virus transmission and health hazards improving air quality. I and mean, I know we had some talks about, you know, H, the F of filters and yep. high quality, all that. Addressing learning loss, including low-income students, children with disabilities, English 
learners, racial, ethnic minority students experience homelessness. So there's a group of, of students, but um, it's addressing learning loss. Um, plus any, hmm. So I'm, I'm hearing your point, but I'm thinking, uh, well, as I'm is, reading this, you know, um, what, yeah. what Esther's funds can be yeah. used for, as I'm reading this, it says, it can be improved, it can be used to invest in digital teaching technology tools, improve your technology technology uh, infrastructure, increase your support staff, substitutes, and employees. That's what the counselors came in. That's my it also said make school repairs. So if we had this Esther's mm -hmm. fund, why couldn't we repair clay? So so right now, the action item that I'm here to speak about is the right to school contract. I, I just thought so those aren't questions. I'm. But I'm just um, simply saying, you said in your comment that you had, you have, you can't use Esther's fund for long term. Correct. Funding. So um, we cannot again anything that we use Esther or CARES dollars funds for, such as even this contract that I bring before, or the the technology enhancements, um, the technology subscriptions. Those would all still expire as of 2024. So we cannot spend those funds on any type of technology advancements or technology enhancements. As far as the building renovations, again, those are out of my context for this evening to talk about this action item. Um, but I'd be happy to get with my colleagues and prepare that information. Yeah, thank you. Because yes. as I said before, and I'm gonna let it go, uh, the $127,000 that you're you're speaking of to go for each one of uh, this this contract here, to be a better spin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lee, you had a comment? I did. Um, at, at the schools were selected based on, is there family demand for the before and after school here at those schools? Sure. And so one of the things we also um, selected schools, if we're looking, if when we look at that sustainability and we have to look at various models, um, we did a mixture of Title I schools, non-title buildings. So if we have to use a variation um, to sustain, we wanted to make sure that we could look at each model, again, if we're able to use Title I funding, we have to go to um, parent pay, partial parent pay, sliding scale. We want to make sure that we did that in different learning environments. And so that's why those schools were selected. The schools that are not on that list have other partners that we partner with that provide after school programming um, as well. Do you, do you imagine, I know that Boys and Girls Club does some of this hiring of school staff. So there's some consistency with the students in those programs. Do you know if that's a model they use too? Sure, yes. So um, again, um, one of the questions that I had received about um, was the staffy. So yes, when they hire their staff, that staff is designated for that location, that site. So there's not a round robin of new staff in. And so the students, but also we want a collaborative conversation between our building staff. Um, and so, you know, some of that staff may also be South Bend staff during the day and then work for right at school. But yes, we want consistent staffing and that is their model. Yeah, it feels like there'd be a really good consistency for academic support. Right. So yes. And I just want to say as a working mom of my kids were little, this 7 a.m. drop off and 6 p.m. pickup, don't don't judge me for being a bad mom, but that 6 p.m. pickup would have been really awesome because 530 was hard. I'm right there with you. Woo. Thank you. Anyone else? You had mentioned sustainability. That's not my only question, but uh by after 2024, we might be able to develop a, a structure so that people in need won't have to pay right. or pay much. But uh, I think the advantage of some of the programs we do have, they don't pay. Correct. So given the level of poverty in our schools, uh, this doesn't seem all that attractive to me because in a short time, we get a program going, maybe, and that'll lead to my other questions. Uh, then we say to the same families, now you got to pay. So again, that's one of the models that we wanted to create and look at is that our most need buildings, we could continue to look at 
an equity standpoint. So some of our buildings could leverage Title I dollars and keep that as a non-pay program. Several of our partners currently are operating with, with similar grants that came out of um, not the same bucket of, of ESSER dollars, but so some of our programming that's offered through our current partners, um, we are actively working collaboratively with them to look at other grant opportunities to keep those programs even as non-pay um, programs. So lots of um, either it be school districts or whether it be community programs, are, we're all kind of looking for those, those additional grant opportunities to continue a lot of our programming, including not only this program, if the board approves, but also our programs provided by, by the other partners. So 2024 is going to be a huge lift um, for a lot of these, but one of the, and that was why we wanted to look at this program in particular, because it will allow us to leverage Title I funding, which we are allowed to do under Title I, where we could still make after school options for those families most in need um, as a free option. Um, but then we could also look at sliding skills and things of that for those families um, that are. Um, and in, currently we do have programs. Um, Kaleidoscope is a pay program um, that I participate in, but I, I have the ability to do so, but one of our questions that we've often asked is how do we provide those same services or to our families who can't? And so this is just one way amongst, the, again, the other partners that we wanna see how we can provide that opportunity for all students. So um, I could imagine you would then give the principal a set of options for how to use the Title I, not you in particular, I just we, the SBCSC would give uh, the principal is the option. I can have a social worker. I can have a cognitive intervention specialist. I can have a reading coach. And you've now used up all your options. Or I choose this program and I don't get to have a cognitive intervention specialist. So we're really placing some of the burden for these decisions on principals who, who would say, I need it all. But can nope. I answer that real quick, Doctor? Yes, of course. So not necessarily with our Title I funding, we do have the ability to use um, all district funding. So there's all district funding sources. So we could look at this such as, again, um, many districts use Title I funding to, to fund pre-K offerings. Well, you can do that across, across your district. Um, we also are allowed to have um, use our carryover funding in various ways to support programming across the district. So it not it, it does not necessarily have to impact um, a school's individual Title I budget. That's good to hear. So you're going to stay, right? <laughs> so that aside, um, <laughs> sorry, the, there, some, this language is pretty boilerplate. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about, as you know, I, I do get involved in some tutoring and staff oversight. Uh, it's really hard in, within this community to find a yes, pool of people who can serve as site directors. And it's true, some you know are coming from the schools themselves, we, but I don't know that we can depend on that because I'm actually looking at you know the fact that you know s staff members at schools to oversee after school programs. That, that takes a lot. It takes you have to be pretty nimble you realize you got to keep changing because you think the kids are going to read, but they're not going to read today. You're doing something else. So I really look toward those site folks to be able to be nimble enough to make those kinds of decisions. But I also wonder uh, about the kinds of extensive instruction that I don't know what it means. Well-qualified and trained staff they're trained using innovative blended learning training models and receive extensive instruction before entering the program. And there's oversight, scheduling, right? It's all really boring. I, how do we know that they're able to find people who can do these things? So we're not their first school district. So they've, they've been That's doing this um, and, and we've spoken to um, and looked into those districts. They've been very pleased um, with, with the product. They've had multiple years partnering um, with them, but I'll also go back to the, the original statement also of our students that are in most need of academic support um, should be participating in our extended learning program. So that's still going on in our buildings with, uh, with our students, um, but those students that are, you know, 
two grade levels or more behind that we are engaging in tutoring right now through various programs. Um, through our working with our teachers after school, those students should still participate in those extended learning programs. But we also have students who need a safe place to go after school who, who may not need, therefore, also the extended learning. And so that's why this is not to replace those interventions and those supports, but our guidance to our principals, to our our interventionists are that we need to be identifying those students who are in need of extended learning, working with our teachers, and then our students who still need a safe place based on whether it be a parent work schedule or just need a place to go after school that we can still engage them in meaningful, engaging, fun learning activities that are around social emotional learning, but also make learning learning fun. Those are the opportunities that we want to provide. So we want to make sure we have a good fit for all of our students, but those students that that I know we are very concerned about who um, need those academic supports, who are below grade level, should still be engaged in extended learning and their tutoring programs. The last question I have, you know, is uh, there are walk. I mean, you know, you're doing a lot of walkthroughs in in classrooms during the day and during the week. Will there be walkthroughs here to say to just be able to assess how are things going? You know, sure. To your point, yes. You know, are we engaging kids and how are we doing that? And we are we varying the day so that they're actually engaged and not just hanging out. Absolutely, and we do that with our current partners now. Um, so there would be no difference to this program um, that we would, you know, principals are are engaged. We have collaborations with all with the partners, not only with the site coordinator and the principal, but actually the, the individuals over the programs. Um, we have, um, I think, as of now, I'm meeting at least monthly myself. Um, and then the DSLs um, are also meeting with principals so we can get feedback about how how are the programs um Operating. Another piece that we've worked with with Mr. Nolan Abrahamian's department is tagging our students in the various programs they participate in. And so then we can look at their their iReady growth that we can look at their at their Dibbles data to assess. Now, again, it is very hard to pin down one variable when we're working with children, but it would be interesting to see. Do we see trends between the various programs that we're offering and do we see accelerated growth in students based on the programs, I think that it should be um, data that we use to inform any decision about any going um, ongoing partnership with any partner, including right at school. And that's why this is a one year contract um, It's not a multi year, because I think that data needs to be reviewed before we make any decisions yeah. moving forward. Well, you know, the exchange we had, I mentioned that the Strategic Operations Committee met last week to discuss this very thing. And the number of options that are available, and this will be this is just a we can bracket bracket this off, but you know we uh, talked about you know how we're assessing these things, but also the coordination of different programs, standard learning programs, you know before and after tutoring programs, and you know I think a concern is whether these programs are being coordinated and making sure, of course, I mean if. You just gave us information that I wasn't aware of about the flex. Sounds like the flexibility of Title One. I hope that that knowledge has a place and that people are aware of that uh, those opportunities. So I wonder in down the road whether we and, and I know people have said we keep hiring uh, people in, in in these various administrative positions, but I would sure like to know that there's oversight and. You're working on it, uh, Rafi's working on it, but is there a dedicated person who's overseeing and coordinating these things? So it's not left to one person's knowledge. So that's- Nope, there is. Ms. Deb Martin, um, who oversees Title I, does a great job. Um, and she is, has, although Title I is one of her kind of focuses right. when we talk about that, she, she definitely coordinates and has ongoing conversations about what we're funding through the ESSER because we know some of that has to live within Title I after that. But yes, um, it exists with her as well as the DSLs and the principals. I mean, all the, the after school. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Paul. Thank you, Chair Nella. Um, Dr. White, does, have we factored in transportation costs 
for the pre and after school care that this would provide? How is transportation addressed? So um, currently we are continuing to talk to Ms. King um, and plan for 23, 24 um, school year. Um, we do have transportation factored into our extended learning offerings. Um, currently, we um, provide that for the middle schools. We still continue um, to work out how we can expand those um, transportation and provide transportation um, for, um, for, for the elementary students based on when we look at the scheduling of, of activities um, and so forth at that elementary tier. Um, but yes, um, we want to make sure that... Um, Transportation is not a barrier, um, especially for our students. And, and, you know, we want to make sure that transportation is not a barrier for our all of the the after school programming. But I would be honest. And have to say that we are prioritizing transportation for those extended learning students, those students who need those those academic supports um, and then begin and work with our families to identify even, you know, that barrier. Or is there a way, you know, for those to pick up? Currently, our programs that go till six o'clock, parents are currently um, picking up those students as of now. Um, but we continue to look at ways um, to be collaborative and also be cost effective um, as we move forward. So currently, no, with our, our elementary programming, we are not providing um, transportation, but we are looking at various options and continue to work with Ms. King. And so if I, I'm trying to make sure I summarize, so extended learning, there is a, a, an effort already in place that, that um, covers transportation because it's extended learning. This is not extended, not the targeted group extended learning. So this is not that group. Correct. Because extended learning is for students who needed more, right? Correct. So this is not that group. Um, I think this is, if I'm summarizing, this is an effort to have something in place at more schools. So would you say that if our um, sustainability plan in, includes in the future Title I, would there be enough, I don't know, would there be enough students who would be eligible for Title I at these schools for it to be financially sustainable or not? Because when I start thinking about transportation, so then you start talking about, well, what parents can or cannot pick up kids at six o'clock? Is that also the same group that's a is it an overlap of a Title I family household? Do they have transportation? Do they do they not? This is not covering transportation. This is just covering staff. Correct. So Staffing. Kinda, All right. And, yeah, and that is a conversation. Yep. And that's an ongoing conversation. I mean, transportation becomes an ever increasing um, cost. One of the things, though, just that all of our schools are school wide Title I. So a student doesn't have to be identified as a Title I student. We can service all students. Um, as long as the school has a designation of a Title I building, it doesn't just um, identify those students. There are some schools that only can work with a certain group. All of our schools are, are school-wide Title I. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. One last comment. Just a comment. All the programs that we have voted on uh, after school uh, and spent all of these dollars on, we have yet to have someone come to this microphone or come to this table to tell us the success of these programs that we have implemented. So that was my contract. That was my comment. We have never had anyone come to this table to tell us the success of these programs that we are putting in place. Thank you. Thank you. And the committee did ask for that. Mm -hmm. I think the schedule now. They need to come to the program, I mean, to the microphone and speak so the public can hear where their tax dollars are going and not just behind the, the closed doors. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Wesley. I think, um, thank you. I think, Mr. White, thank you so much. Um, I think it would be a good, a great opportunity for all the partners. Uh, you have some partners that have been providing after school programming for almost 12 years, um, some even longer. Um, and that have federal, uh, the federal grants, and um, also that have evaluators, outside evaluation um, evaluators that could probably present with them. So I think that would be excellent. That was one of the questions is, that I wanted to ask: is uh, is right at school? Do they do do they house an outside evaluation team? Um, that was a question. That's not something you answer right now, but if you get a chance, and also to look at their professional development plan. And if there is a sustainability plan, I know some of the other partners that you do have um, are, have federal funding, uh, after school funding, um, 
and also have outside evaluator, a state evaluator, and a professional development plan um, that's readily available. Um, and so I think that would be, to stay consistent, I think that would be ideal if you could, if those are some of the questions that you could ask the partner that they can pro provide so you can stay at a, at a um, level ground with all of your partners that are providing so it's equitable around the whole district. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hernandez, uh, roll, please. I'm sorry. Maybe I have just one more question. So as I'm looking in, at this um, contract, I see the schools that are listed. Have we identified who is going to be the overseers or after school program partners? I'm sorry, can you? Have you identified who the partners are that's, that's supposed to be over this, this program, this contract that we have here? At the individual schools or this right of school contract in itself? So you said, I have the individual schools listed, but you said this is an after school program? Correct. Okay, so each one of the schools, who is leading the after school program? Right, so within this contract, it would be right at school. So right, it's in the school. Right, so, so right at school program. So there would be, are you meaning at the district level or? So, so let me just give you, let me just say this. So at, at um, it's an after school program. So the $127,000 for each one of these schools, and that's that's what, six of them listed? Yes. So say for instance, we, we name uh, Kennedy Elementary School. Yes. So who is overseeing the after school program at that school? Sorry, I, I apologize. So within the contract, there is um, that 127,000 staffs, um, at, and I don't have the ratio. I can look it up. It's here in my packet. Is it a teacher or? So it's a site coordinator that right at school would hire. There would also be staff. So it could be a teacher, um, but that individual goes through background checks, goes but, um, through their training. So it would function again, just like our current programming with our other partners. We have um, site coordinators. Some of those are South Bend Community Schools employees already, and they work this as an after school program. Some of them are community members that have gone through those organizations background checks. So there will be a site coordinator at each building. That site coordinator then um, works collaboratively with the principal to communicate anything that may happen um, in the in the afternoon. And then the curriculum and instruction department um, will then oversee it from a district level. Okay, so let me my last question. So the person that's the person that will be overseeing this after school program to help the students academically. Are they certified teachers or are they certified in education or are they certified in, this, in, in, in helping the students learn? So for the extended learning program, that is the academic component. Yes, those are our teachers, um, South Bend Community Schools teachers. This program, again, um, although it does offer academic support, is more about providing an opportunity for, for um, our students who may not need the academic supports that we've outlined, but this is for our students that also need a place to go. One of our goals was to ensure or to work towards every student who needs it has a place to go after school. Um, and so this is one of those, one of the components of our total after school programming across the district. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hernandez, roll please. <clears throat> Ms. Ball. Aye. Dr. Green. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. McCullough. Aye. Mr. Costello, Costello. No. Ms. Wesley. Aye. Ms. Ranella. Aye. Okay, 9.01 has been approved. A 9.02, it is recommended that the board approve the purchase of materials and supplies to support summer learning STEM related activities. Remaining carryover Title I funds will be used to fund this purchase. The total cost is $207,192.60. The materials and supplies will be used year after year. Uh, this is for Lego Education Inc. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Uh, moved by Ms. Wesley, seconded by Dr. Green. You're still there, Dr. White. I'm here for all three this evening. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, it's good to have you. Sure. Um, so this is um, we are using again. I had mentioned this previously. These are carryover Title One dollars. So the the federal government, any um, expenditures or um, re remaining Title One money from your previous year, you're allowed to carry over 
a certain percentage. That carryover comes from, again, fringe benefits that we can budget for, um, but we don't always expend salaries, those types of things. So we get those funds. Um, this is a great investment. It is not just purchasing Legos, which it may seem like, um, but it's actually the STEM education um, that comes along with Lego education. So it provides all of the, all of the, the materials, the kits for students to engage in um, the STEM-based learning activities as, as well as the professional development for the teachers. Um, at the end of our, our summer learning program, these can be packaged, stored, and used next year. So we will not be coming back um, asking for um, to spend this large amount for the following year is actually an investment. Um, we have used um, the same STEM-based program for the last three years. Um, so although our students enjoyed it, they've been engaged in it for three years, it's time to look at what's new, give them new learning opportunities. And so this is what um, these materials and curriculum will be able to, be able to provide during the summer learning um, for this summer and beyond. Thank you. Yes. Questions, comments? I just have one quick question. Yep. So the, let me help me understand this. The Title I's um, funds that's, that's over. Carryover. The carryover, Title carry I carryover, over, carry, yes. Carryover. So can these funds be uh, used to buy like books for the classrooms? Yes, and we do spend um, carryover each year on uh, okay. purchasing books. Can they be used to uh, improve the, uh, whatever the teachers need in their classrooms to help their kids learn? Um, so we use our Title I funding throughout the year, um, including carryover dollars to pro, um, to provide those. As of now, um, one of our commitments the past four years has to ensure that any adopted materials, any supplemental materials that curriculum instruction has designated um, as a material that should be used in a classroom, we've made sure um, to provide that for every teacher. Um, in addition, um, we are then um, each principal, again, through the looking at their school improvement plan, can also make decisions to make um, additional supplies, resources, purchases that are specific to their school. Um, we use um, our literacy call grant to purchase um, books. We're doing that currently, um, not only for uh, classrooms, but also for libraries as well. So yes, we use numerous funding sources to make sure that um, teachers have those resources. That okay, so this is my last comment. So this is where I see this $207,192.62 going as a carryover for a Title I. In my, in my mind, as an educator, I'm thinking that we should look at all of our schools, especially the elementary schools, middle schools, to see what teachers actually need and that don't have in their classrooms. And this do these dollars could possibly go to those teachers to stock their classrooms up, whatever there it is they're missing, as opposed to spending $207,192.60 on purchasing items that you use in the summer. Thank you. Anyone else? I just like to say a couple of things. Um, Dr. White, thank you. Um, we're moving the mark on being innovative, especially exposing our kids to uh, Legos. We've been behind as a district uh, with robotics, uh, with the uh, Legos, and being able to provide our students with some summer summer of innovation. So thank you very much um, because we need we know there's the summer learning loss. We know students um, lose a lot of uh, their learning skills in the summer. So I'd like to thank you for continuing to be innovative and creative and making sure. I think one of the things that's going to be important, Dr. Cummings and to um, Dr. White before you leave, is that I think it's going to be important if we can, at one of the um, school board meetings, to really make people understand what a grant really is and what grant restrictions are and that grants are soft money. And it's very difficult to hire people off of grants because it's not longevity. Um, grants also in their assurances can be can be stopped. They can be altered and then you have personnel. So I think that if, we, if there is a possibility between now and the fall of having a grant overview with an expert to come in and present the different grants that we have, 
I think that would be very important because I think that individuals think that we have a lot of money that's just out there. Grants are soft money. General fund, what's a general fund? What's title one? What's title two? What's title three and four? And just maybe a, a sheet that will show uh, what the different funding um, restrictions from the federal government and what you can and cannot purchase. What's the timeline? If you're on a four-year grant, you know at year four, you can't purchase computer um, equipment, you can't purchase software. And I think that'll be very important because I think there's a, the misconception about the ESSA money. It was very restricted. It was student recovery. Um, a lot of it from the state and federal level, I just came back from a big conference, used for after school, before and after school programming and summer um, learning. So it's important that we educate ourselves before we make assumptions. So I appreciate you taking the time to, um, you know, be innovative with you and your staff and making sure that we can utilize our dollars. I know some districts had to send their money back because they have been using dollars over the years. Um, and so um, thank you for thinking about the students uh, and being able to elevate us to be innovative to the next post 21st century skills of getting our students engaged. Um, and what we call those employability skills. So thank you. Thank you. One quick comment. I had one quick comment. So let me just say this uh, to the public and the people sitting in the room. As an educator and a doctoral con uh, candidate for the education program, I understand perfectly well what a grant is. I also understand when a grant runs out then we should be able to be able to supplement that grant money with other monies from this corporation. That's just a holdover until we get ourselves together enough to supplement that money. I get it. I get what grant money is, and I, I understand grant money runs out. So I do get that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hernandez, uh, roll please. Ms. Ball. Aye. Dr. Green. Aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. McCullough. Aye. Mr. Costello? No. Ms. Wesley? Aye. Mr. Anella? Aye. Okay, 9.02 has been approved. 9.03 uh, has recommended the board approve the contract with Ghost Solutions Inc. in the amount of $44,230.80. This is software supports the district in recouping Medicaid reimbursements for eligible services provided to students. Medicaid reimbursement and a special education grant will be used to fund this service. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Okay. Moved by Ms. Wesley, seconded by Dr. Green. Dr. White, you're still there. So last one. Yes. So this is one, and I am here. Ms. Brewer is um, at a conference, our um, director of exceptional learners. But I also want to come because I want to own this one. So a couple of years back, we um, changed our Medicaid reimbursement solutions. Um, and um, we worked through the implementation um, process and we came through some snacks on on the technical side. Um, our IT department was amazing and worked through them on our end, but the company that we previously were contracted with cannot work with through their issues on their end, which caused delay in Medicaid billing. Um, I own that because I was the one that was a company that I brought to you all. So uh, tonight I'm bringing a solution no pun intended, that is called Go Solutions. Um, but this is a Medicaid reimbursement solution. One of the questions that I know is, how are we gonna make sure what happened before does not happen again? Um, Go Solutions is used by several Indiana districts um, already for Medicaid re reimbursement. Um, this is something that is a standard practice um, where we are able to um, receive Medicaid reimbursement for several services that we provide to our students that are services um, through individual education, um, individualized education plans. And so um, this is, again, to overcome an issue that we've been kind of dealing with throughout the past year. Um, and we're not able to come to a solution that I believe worked for us to be able to maximize our abilities um, to get Medicaid reimbursement. And so this is just really a shift from one provider to a new provider. Thank you. Yes. Um, and also, this is two years, right? Yes. So that's why it's on here, because it's 44,000 times two. Yep. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Ball. Thank you, Chair Nella. I have a question. And um, 
The question is, do you have any idea of what our potential recapture of funds might be moving from the problematic old software or whatever it was to this new software? Was there money? It, it sounds to me like there was money left on the table, right? Sure. Because if you're not billing, you're not getting the money. So do we have an idea of what we might be recapturing? Sure. So um, I, I can offer that in one of, of two ways. Previously, um, prior to COVID, um, the the district, I, I believe my first year, it was in the ballpark of around $80,000 of Medicaid reimbursement. A district our size um, should be able to um, receive far more. We know we... We know that we provide more services than that amount that are Medicaid reimbursable. Um, what we've also done, and the reason why I said it's a two-parter is we should also be able to maximize because um, the district has made advancements in our transportation software. And so some of the transportation we provide to our students with exceptional needs can also be um, Medicaid reimbursed. And that's something that the district had not done in the past just because of the system not allowing that. Now that we have that capability, that, that would be something also that we can expand and begin to implement into the Medicaid reimbursement. But I don't have those numbers because we've not done it before. Well, but it would be more than what we had received. It would be more. Yes. Do you have an, man, there's not an example from a comparable school court, like, okay, we were getting 80 pre-COVID. Those other corps who are comparable to us were getting 260, 370, you know, do you right. got? The, the reason, so I don't have that that information. And the reason why is because it varies on the student's exceptionality. So we could be a district of very similar size demographics but the students right it's the the students that we service are um I'm sorry I'm just having a hard time hearing you mm -hmm. um the the students that we service and therefore those services that are Medicaid reimbursable are really hard to compare to yeah. a district Another, to district yeah so more yeah. we should see more coming in okay. hmm? this isn't time for comments from the audience please go ahead Miss Ball Oh, that's it. Okay. No, I'm good. thank, thank yep. you, Dr. White. Thank you. Okay, uh, roll please, Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Ball? Aye. Dr. Green? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. McCullough? I don't have enough information, so I'm going to have to abstain on that one. Mr. Costello? Aye. Ms. Wesley? Aye. Ms. Ranella? Aye. Okay, 9.03 has been approved. That brings us to the end of our action items. Uh, we did have one item from closed session. Uh, I would like to make a motion that the board approve the settlement agreement resolving the claims of the employee that were discussed in executive session, including those claims made under EEOC charge number 24M-2023-00007. In exchange for the sum of $2,000 and the other terms described in the agreement. Do we have a second? Second. Got a second. And Mr. Hernandez, I ask you to do the roll, please. Ms. Ball. Aye. Dr. Green? Aye. Ms. Lee? Aye. Ms. McCullough? Aye. Mr. Costello? Aye. Ms. Wesley? Abstain. Ms. Ranella? Aye. Okay. The settlement agreement's been approved. That's our only item from closed session. That brings us to board communications. Uh, the board has the opportunity to speak at this time. Does anyone wish to speak at this time? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. McCullough? Over to you. There's uh, several things that um, I'm, I like to talk about. That's been on my mind as an educator. First, before I can start, let me just say this. Teachers do matter. So does the bus drivers. And as an educator, a doctoral candidate for education, I get it. I get the hours. And so I don't know where you heard or, or someone told you that the board wants the 80 hours. Nobody speaks for me, I speak for me. And I don't agree with the 80 hours. So let me move on to my comments here. As I look back on these assistant superintendent titles, and I researched this, this because I wanted to know, as an educator, you know, the Department of Education only lists your degrees if you have a degree in that area. So I went back to look 
if you are not, if you do not have a superintendent's license, you should not be uh, classified as assistant superintendent or superintendent. You should not be. So these titles that we, we're seeing, assistant superintendents, if they don't have assistant, if they don't have a superintendent's license, those titles should come off and they should go back to their regular job title. And it's not assistant superintendent. When, it report, when, when it's reported to the state, I looked it up, it's not reported to the state as assistant superintendents, their directors or their, their, their titles are something different. So we are in this corporation are the only place where we have assistant superintendent titles. Those titles need to be taken off. Um, I had one other thing here that I wanted to talk about. And that was the zone. I think I already talked about that. And as I will say it again, the zone, those students, people are saying that um, they are, um, people, a lot of people that don't, don't agree with the, with, the, with the zone schools. But let me just say this. The reason why I disagree with the zone schools is because it's the title. It's the title. No one can tell me what zone means. No one can tell me what transportation, transformation means and why it was attached to those particular schools. We like all of our kids and our, those kids are our kids. That title needs to come off of those schools and we need to treat those schools as a South Bend Community School Corporation school district. We are one district. We're not chopped up and we're not two districts. The way they've got it, they've got it chopped up and they need to bring those schools back into coordinates. So one other thing, when I printed off my agenda for this evening and I'm looking at the agenda on the computer, there was one item that was left off of there and I just wanna know if someone can tell me what's happening with this item. If it's gonna be brought up again, or if it's uh, what's going on with this diptych item. And that's the College Academics Development Coordinator. It was on the agenda when I printed it off as 9.01. But when I look at the computer, it was not there. So if someone's telling me, is this gonna be something that's gonna come up again? Or what's gonna happen with that particular title? Yes, I'm listening. The next board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wesley? Yes, I'd just like to say to all of, to Dr. Cummins, to you and your amazing staff, all of our amazing teachers, students, families, bus drivers, everyone. I'm just going to continue to say I thank you. Um, continue where we have almost a month away from school being out, and then uh, we will have one full year under our belt. So again, thank you for everything. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, a special thank you to all of my wonderful students that I've seen in all of those buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Costello. Well, I don't know where to begin because I'm still trying to recover from two weeks ago. Um, I'm very, very disappointed then and I'm still disappointed now. I was getting over it until Sunday, April 23rd, 2023, when reading in the South Bend Tribune that Mark Costello uh, made a comment, and that's the only comment that she had listed, but made a comment that uh, the consultants of the facility building and our, super, our superintendent did not have any arrangement uh, beforehand with that group. Now, I tried to lay out a case, and it took me 44 minutes, not 45, like the Tribune reported, to show people what actually happened. 
Do I have a voice on tape with them saying, Dr. Cummings saying to them, hey, close clay? No, I don't. But this leads me to a, another point of reference here. You know, I've been in this business a long time and I've been through four or five different superintendents. I've worked for quite a few. I've been at board meetings. Um, there are some things that superintendents do that's their most important job, and that is to lead. There are leaders in the most probably important decision that this board has, school corporation as a school board has made, maybe in the history of South Bend. We had an opportunity tonight at five o'clock or four o'clock till 515 to talk to Dr. Lewis about the empowerment zone. We had a chance to sit around and the first thing he did was say, do you have any questions? How many times has the consultants, we sat down with the consultants and they said, do you have any questions? Zero, because every time this board ever met with that consultant group, they lectured to us what they had. Never once did we sit down and I asked for that. To have a chance to talk to all board members. And the only time I was able to do that was about 15, 20 minutes before we actually took a vote on it a couple of weeks ago. I think that is a crying shame. And then you get to the, from the understanding that it's not against the law for a super, superintendent to talk to a consultant group, especially give them our, their ideas. I would expect that from any superintendent because I've seen it, I've done it. But I always shared whatever information I received from them or what I gave them, I always shared it with the board. That was never done. At least that was not done for the three of us. And that's the reason why I'm unhappy. Then there's other reasons why I'm unhappy. We keep hearing about this financial crisis. Uh -huh. We have people from your cabinet out there saying we got a financial crisis and that's the reason why we closed Clay. I asked you one-on-one, -on -one, do we have enough funds to fund this year's budget? You said yes. I asked you, did you, we have enough funds in here? How's the referendum budget going? It looks pretty good. Where's the crisis? Why did we close clay? Couldn't we have done both? That's, that's the number one question. If I really had an opportunity, I was thrown in just before we voted on that for some questions for them, but never with the opportunity to sit down and really study what they're saying. Did we have enough in that budget, that referent budget to do both? Fix clay, throw that school and have a career center. Who knows? We never had a chance. And these people who keep coming up here, they will never quit people. I know them because they want answers and you haven't provided it for them. And I told you ahead of time, you have not provided a plan for this. 
The next day after I said that, you put out some statement to the public saying this is what you're going to do. That's the first written statement you ever had. And it didn't come until I asked you about it. Citizens come forward, ask you about budget items, never a response back to them. The first priority, number one, would be responding back to the public if they have questions about a budget item. School board member here asked you questions about the budget items. She said she'd never get back with her on the budget items, Mrs. McCullough. No. We have people who come up here with tears in their eyes about it, it, their employment in our corporation, either teachers or transportation people, security guards, paraprofessionals who make $20,000 a year and we worked their butts off because I was one of them for seven or eight years. You can't replace those people, those dedicated people. That's right. So I'm going to come public tonight with some information about your salary because it's public. Right. It's no secret, even though I've asked board members how much you make. Nobody knew. Why? Before we ever, every year it should be out there how much you make and we should vote on it. That's the way it's done. Two thousand nineteen, you made one hundred and ninety one thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars. I think that was your first year, wasn't it? Didn't you come in the fall? 2019. 2019. So it probably was in with what you made as a human resource person, and then you came in as superintendent. The next year, 2020, you made $261,305. And this puzzles me because 2021, you made $258,553. It went down. And then 2022, you made 251,487 with 3,300 employees. That's what you have. Let me give you a little bit of background to this figure. Evansville, Vandenberg School Corporation, their superintendent with 8,405 employees, so about two and a half times more than we have, made 270,464. And that, that's because he's been there for years. Hammond City School Corp. The demographics are very similar to South Bend. Their superintendent makes 225,813 and he has 8,056 employees. Fort Wayne Community School Corporation. They have 5,493 employees and they're He's paid the superintendent two hundred and thirty seven thousand two two hundred and seventy. Now, Penn Harris Madison, their school uh, superintendent, I guess he was there and then left and came back. So he's been around a while. He makes two hundred and forty five thousand one hundred and sixty one dollars and he has almost the same amount employees as we do. 
Michigan City School Corporation. Now they, they only have a, a little over a thousand employees. Their superintendent makes $141,665. Now, this board needs to get serious about this stuff. If we are going to take fiscal responsibility for this board's action, then you, we all need to be responsible for this type of stuff. How in the heck can he make 250,000 plus dollars and we don't even know about it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do wanna state uh, that board members have opinions and I may disagree with some of those as far as what went down with consultants, some of the terminology, uh, and we can discuss how the superintendent's paid and how the state system accounts for it. And also because as we know with employees, there's also cost of employment, which isn't just salary, but benefits and other things. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole at this moment, but uh, I would I would implore my fellow board members that we work for the school corporation, we're advocates for the school corporation, and whether we dislike some of the things that go on, uh, we should work hard to have a collegial collaborative atmosphere um, because we're trying to work for the Southman schools and it's not about us. I have, so with that, I'm, I'm going to end this me. meeting. I have, one, I have one quick question, yep. one quick, quick comment, one quick comment. Piggybacking off of Mr. Costello, and we have to get serious about it. However, you not like the conversations, you might not like the comments, but it's serious. Um, we have to understand that when we approved this referendum, part of that salary was increased. Uh, the superintendent was given $25,000 for uh, passing a referendum. Those teachers worked hard going door to door to pass that referendum, not the superintendent. So that's where that discrepancy came from. And when we ask questions as a board member, the policy says that we should not be denied documents or information. And we have, I have been denied documents and information. So Mr. Costello is absolutely correct. Correct. If you don't know something, you don't know it. That's why when you, when we, when you see something on here regarding finances, I say nay, simply because I don't have a clear picture of what's happening in those finances. So however you not, might not like the conversation or comments, Mr. Costello is absolutely correct. Uh, one more comment. I had someone approach me after a meeting and ask me, why does the CFO speak for the district? She wasn't hired to speak for the district. The superintendent was. And so my question was to the superintendent, why is this person speaking for this district? She's a super assistant superintendent of business and finance. She wasn't hired to speak for this district. I'm gonna leave that comment at that because we have to have, when we are, when we are speaking in public, the leader of this district should be speaking, not the CFO. Thank you. Okay, I'm adjourning this meeting for this evening and we will see everyone on May 15th. Have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Thank you, Ms. McCullum. Dr. Green, thank you. Mr. Nella, thank you. 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 Th